Hello, Noor. Can you hear me? Uh, ha ha hello, Dr. John Bennett. I can hear you. Can you please uh, um, read the text I have just sent to you on Messenger? Oh, I'm sorry. You don't want all people on the panel. Okay, I'm, I missed yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just stick to that, yeah, please. Okay, okay. I'm uh, sorry about yes. that. Uh, yes, hey, Dr. Gato is in the panel, right? Yeah. Dr. Gato, Dr. Fazi Sajad, uh, and okay. only. I'm and... going to make I'm going to make you host. Yeah. So so yeah. you can let the people in that you want to let in. Yes, and please kindly just just follow it before uh, Professor Barba joins in. So it's 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 something that is very important right now to do. Oh, okay. Yeah, please keep that. Yeah, keep it a little. You know, stick okay. that. Okay, so just let the people in that you want to let. Yeah. You know how to, you know how to do that, right? Uh, obviously, I do know, but only uh, you know we are the only six people who are. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you know how to do that? Yes or no? Uh, obviously, I do. Obviously, oh, okay. I do. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, just to keep me, uh, Professor Borber, uh, then there will be Professor Fozzi Sajad, uh, Dr. Luana Gato, Dr. Caroline Benjamin, and obviously Professor Nalsi and Professor uh, Najia Al Abadi. And uh, yes, Louis Borber himself. Yeah, I, I think I'll get all of them, but just to make sure you can, yeah. let, them, you can let them in. Fawzia yeah. Sajad is in, needs to be in, there. Right? Only uh, right now, only Fawzia, uh, Professor Fawzia Sajad and Dr. Luana Gato, they are oh, the is only. Is Fawzia Sajad a panelist? Yes. yes. Okay. And Dr. Luana Gato, obviously, do, these are our two speakers. So just keep the speaker in the panel, okay? Okay, you see you see people in the panel, right? You, you see them, right? I do. The, the uh, co-host on the right. Yeah, is there, it's, is there anybody there that needs to be in? Oh, yeah, Professor Nelsi will be there. Um, Professor Nelsi, Professor Naji Alabadi, Dr. Ab uh, Abia, um, is, uh, just uh, let me see. But you have to just the, the attendees, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, they're, they're not in. No, 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 they haven't yet joined in. Okay, just keep an eye on that, okay. Yeah, that, that's on, on, on the right side of the panel, so I'm just following it, uh, right, you know. Right, you just allow them to enter. 
Yeah, exactly. So just do it before Professor Bobo joins in. And I, yeah, you promote the panelists, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I'll keep an eye, but, you know, you have to follow that very strictly. You know, else we are going to lose it all. <laughs> it's very okay. simple about that. Yeah, you, you know that. Yeah, already. So it's my second account from uh, my mobile phone that will join in. That is Nuranda as well. Uh, to have to make it... Uh, um, okay, I just put it... To, Okay, Nora, greet your guests. Yeah, 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 just, just a moment. <laughs> I'm just uh, making it all work, you know, right now. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a huge honor to see you, everyone, here today on the Women's Day, which is a um, very special day for all women, but especially in, um, a very special day for women neurosurgeons who have got a huge uh, contribution to the progress of this neurosurgical field. And I think that it is the time to celebrate this moment uh, in the most um, particular way. Uh, no, you don't have to be that special. I mean, this is informal. We haven't started yet. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I'm just uh, just Thanks going all. to hello everyone, welcome. Welcome <laughs> to Surgical TV. This is Nor. She's gonna run the show. Okay, now Nor, I'm just gonna introduce you when you like 10 9 8 seven, and then you said hi, I'm Nor. And okay. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. And you're just, and, you know, I'm not even gonna be on the screen because I'm just a distraction. I'm just gonna introduce you. And you take it away, okay? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll be doing that. I'll be doing that. I, I think uh, Professor Borba will join in and he will give a little talk on... Uh, it's, up to you. it's up to you. You can take me to Disney World if you want. But you just, <laughs> no. I'm no. going to introduce you and you take us where you want to go. Dr. Bannett, I want to show you one thing that Professor Fozzi Sajjad is one of my mentors. I think I have mentioned that to you before. So I'm really overwhelmed that she's here right now and a little conscious because she's my senior and she's a professor of neurosurgery, the first woman neurosurgeon in Pakistan that has been promoted as a professor of neurosurgery in the history. You know, so she made history. She's now the chair of the Vince Pakistan chapter. So, and also I, I, I've got the honor to call her my mentor. Uh, she used to be in, at Vince, so she had to go to the other city to get her permission then so i'm really happy to have her here so a huge shout out for my own mentor as well um, um hello madam for professor Kelsey Sajad. it's a huge honor to see you here um hello good evening no thank you so much for inviting me on such a good occasion and for a nice talk i'm very happy and grateful to the organizing committee and especially to you thank you so, uh, a pleasure and honor is more mine, uh, madam. And another uh, huge hi, a how, huge shout out to Dr. Luana Gado. She's also a young women neurosurgeon uh, from Brazil, a women neurointerventionalist from Brazil. So it's a huge honor to have her here. It's the first time I'm going to see her and I'm really overwhelmed to welcome her to the program, to the panel, to have her as a speaker. So Professor uh, Dr. Luana, will you share a few words with us? It's it's a huge honor. So again, thank you so much for coming. You, Luana, thank you. you turn thank your, you for uh, inviting me. Can you turn, you got your camera working, Luana? It doesn't seem to be working now. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Luana, uh, uh, Dr. Bannett wants to uh, wants you to turn your video on uh, so that we can see that um, you can share it well. You can't, your camera works okay? Okay, great. Okay, it works hey. okay. That's fine. That's hey. great. Okay. Good morning. Okay, um, Fazia, Fazia, does your camera work okay? Madam, um, Madam, will you turn your uh, camera on? There we go. There we go. Hi, Hi Madam. Welcome. See you, Madam. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much, both of you ladies. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we would like to, you to have a slide test. Can you please screen your share, uh, sc uh, share your screen so that we can see that uh, everything is going smoothly? Hey, 
I'm on duty at the hospital now, right now. <laughs> no, it's only in Pakistan time. <laughs> Yeah, if anybody wants to practice screen sharing, go ahead. Oh, amazing, ma'am. Good work, ma'am. We can see it. We don't, I don't think that you have got any video or something like that. So there's nothing of a uh, huge concern right now. Thank you so much. You can now stop sharing your screen. And uh, let's see. Dr. Luana. Dr. Luana. Dr. Luana, will you please share your screen? Hi. Hi. It's a huge honor to have you here. Will you please screen? I'm not on computer right now. I'm not, I have no my uh, I don't have my notebook right now because I'm I'm duty in the, at the hospital. Oh wow. But in, in 20 minutes, I have my notebook here. Okay, we got 12 minutes to start. I don't know where in the order you are. But I think that you have uh, got an idea how to share the screen. Yeah, just trying to yeah. make sure, um, you know, if, there, if there's anything that we can do that, that we have to intervene in so that we can just proceed with that. <laughs> you know that. Do you see? Not yet. Much okay. Do you see my my screen? Oh no, unfortunately not no. yet. No, unfortunately. Oh, no, your your camera's off, Nor. That is on now. There's a little lag uh, with the DSLR, you know. <laughs> it gets a little tricky. Oh, okay. Uh, Professor Nelson. Yeah. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So now the is here. Uh, it's okay. A picture. Yes, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Nice. It's working nicely. How, uh, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> Good work. Good job. How, about Professor Nelsi? I think Professor Nelsi has just joined the panel. Bon dia, ma'am. Morning, dears. Morning. Morning. Thank you so much, Madam. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Happy Women's Day, Madam. It's a huge honor to have you here today with us. It's, you know, um, I'm overwhelmed with joy to see you here in the panel. You are a huge inspiration for all of us. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you, dear. So kind of words. It's a privilege to be with you. Uh, her honor is all ours, ma'am. So it's it's something that uh, you know. When I sent you the invitation, I was like, "Oh my God! If she comes, it would be a huge thing for us." Because um, I think personally, I believe that I feel so much inspired by you. So I think that I, if I feel this way, that, then every woman researcher feels the same way. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to deliver your wonderful lecture. It means a lot. Hope you can uh, feel your respectancy, my dear. <laughs> Not sure that we can do, but we do our, be our best always. No, ma'am, you are all doing a lot. Uh, so there's a lot of support in that area. We have been morally, yeah, like you see, that there's someone who can actually support you. And it's a big honor to see that you are chairing the Education Committee of ISP. And it's really a big honor and a you know, a huge achievement um, on the part of women neurosurgeons. So thank you so much for joining in. Thank you, dear. Uh, Madam, would you like to? Uh, 
you you've been doing this all the time but if you like then you can discuss your slides yes sure ready amazing. to do it thing amazing ma'am thank you so much you you've been doing this all all the year and i've been i have got the privilege of attending several of your lectures those were so wonderful so wonderful so i just kept listening to all of your and other pieces of advices that you gave in your lectures that means a lot madam thank you welcome i just stopped sharing uh, the audio is quite okay because i i'm not with headphone headset yeah, yeah the audio is fine audio is fine Fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I will stop sharing just to give you the opportunity to to keep going. Thank you so much, Madam. Um, Madam, we have got uh, two other speakers right now who have just joined in. Uh, this is Professor Fazia Sajjad. She is one of my own mentors from Pakistan, and she is the first woman neurosurgeon who has been promoted as Professor of Neurosurgery in Pakistan, and also the chair a person of Vince Pakistan chapter. Is she welcome? Good evening. I'll see. Good the other Uh, Madam, the other speaker that we have right now is Dr. Luana Gato. She's from Brazil, uh, a new internationalist, a young neurosurgeon as well. Welcome, Luana. You are mute. Try to unmute yourself, Luana. Okay. It's really a pleasure to be here with you and celebrating the International Women's Day. And congratulations for all, you all. <laughs> Madam, unfortunately, you cannot attend the WFNS 2022 in Colombia, Bogota, gonna miss that and really gonna miss the opportunity to meeting, to having the privilege of meeting several of wonderful mentors like you this year. Uh, this year is a very special year. Uh, after two years uh, without meetings, it doesn't know how we'll be there, but probably it will be okay to restart face-to-face uh, -face meetings. Uh, yeah, ma'am, I hope I'm, I'm praying a lot for everything to get. Yeah. Five, five that. minutes, Noor. Five minutes, Noor. Thank and you. The, is the first speaker here? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm in. Thank you. Yeah. I think Dr. Uh, Najia had, got her talk rescheduled because she had to go uh, and deliver a talk on another um, platform so i think but she hasn't yet joined in um madam after your talk it was her talk so um i think but i haven't yet seen her on the, in the panel right now <laughs> i think she might be joining us shortly you're doing another women's day in turkey right uh, nor Yes, yes. Uh, after this, uh, one hour after uh, after this uh, show, I will just join them. Yes, breaking the glass ceiling. Busy day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of busy day. But it it is going to be a, a very interesting um, uh, webinar as well. So I would like to kindly invite all of you. It will be a matter of huge privilege and honor, and obviously support if you all join in um, our uh, another talk today on uh, on the Women's Day. It is on you know how women are coping through the field of neurosurgery against all odds and how they are breaking the you know the and everything. I'm just sharing. Uh, um, Dr. Bandit is also televising that show. Dr. Bandit, do you have the link right now? Can we share the link? Yeah, let me get it. Link, link to yoga. 
Okay, nak jumpa kerja tu barang ni. Okay, you know, the all the information of that meeting from Turkey is on the chat, including the link. If Amazing, anybody, thank you so much. Yeah, if anybody wants to go to that <clears throat> after this. Yeah, please do. Um, I really want to cordially invite you all to this wonderful webinar that is being organized by the Turkish Neurosurgical Society under the uh, under the umbrella of Ismail Online uh, platform. Uh, you know, this is a very important webinar. In my webinar, I just try to uh, organize it in a way that I uh, highlight the academic achievements rather than you know conducting a classical uh, Women's Day webinar where women are uh, just trying to share their views. Because I really wanted to tell everybody that women. Uh, have a lot of academic achievements that they they are the speakers so it's, it's something huge i think this is the best way to portray uh, the very uh, important aspect of women research and so uh, in this webinar uh, we were a little uh, we deviated a little from the classical women's day type of a of a event uh, but the other event is extremely important in the way uh, where we are actually along with uh, dr Eileen ojal and um, also professor martin stipler we are going to highlight the uh, issues of women neurosurgeons and how are they coping it. My talk will be on how the challenges women neurosurgeons are facing in the low middle income countries. So I think that it is a very important webinar and I hope that you all can join in. It will be a matter of great uh, honor for me to have you all around and to hear your views. Okay, I think, Noor, are you ready to start, Noor? Yeah, sure. Dr. Baba has um, uh, just joined in. Okay, well, Hey, Dr. Barbara, how are you doing? Welcome. Hello, good morning. Morning. How are you? Good. Okay. Morning. Good timing. We're, we're, about to, we're, we're about to start. Obrigada. Yeah. <laughs> Oi, Luana, tudo bem? Oi, tudo. Hello. Okay. Hey, Nor. I, I, Nor, Nor, speak, Nor speak Portuguese. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I said, I said, bom dia, bom dia. Tout la monde, bom dia. Bom dia de la mujer, I guess that's it. De la mujer, eles misturam tudo, eles misturam português e espanhol tudo junto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just, I just, uh, I, I know a little bit of Spanish, um, but actually, unfortunately, I do not know much of Portuguese, a little bit of French and a little bit of Spanish. So, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, Nora, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, everybody. Good evening, good morning, or good night, according to your own time zones. Uh, but a huge greetings to everyone who has joined in today to celebrate this wonderful day of women's, uh, International Women's Day. Um, I think it is a very important occasion for every woman around the world. But for women neurosurgeons, it is a very important day. And I think that it is um, a day for us to support and to highlight the academic contribution of women neurosurgeons in the progress of this field. I'm really honored and pleased to invite wonderful uh, women leaders, the women neurosurgeons who are leaders in the respective countries. And I think that they are all a source of huge inspiration for not only the women neurosurgeons, but neurosurgeons in general. I'm really honored to invite 
Professor Nelsi Zenon from Brazil, who is also the chair of Education Committee um, of the ISBN. And um, I'm also honored to invite uh, Professor Najee Al Abdi, who is uh, WFNS president elect. It's a huge pleasure to invite my own mentor, Professor Fazia Sajjad from Pakistan, who is the first woman professor of neurosurgery, and she is the chair of the Women's Chapter of Pakistan. I'm really uh, happy to invite another young neurointerventionist from Brazil, Dr. Luana Gato, who will be delivering a talk on neuroradiology. It's a huge honor to see someone um, so young doing a lot of uh, progress in the field of neuroradiology and intervention. Um, uh, Dr. Carolina Benjamin from the University of Miami, she's Associate Professor of uh, Neurosurgery, will also be joining us to deliver a talk on the DTI and fMRI, both of the very important new modalities. Um, so again, um, thanks you so much, Professor Luis Porba, for directing and supervising this wonderful series. I would like to invite you to deliver a few words on the contribution of women neurosurgeons, the progress of the field. Thank you. The floor is yours now, sir. Okay. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Elsie, Luana, Professor Fauzia, and all the people around the world that are watching this and will watch in the future our webinar. No, no, in the last years, not only the neurosurgery, but the whole medicine is changing. If you go to the medical school, today more than 60% of the students are women. You see, in the neurosurgery is not different. It's going the same way that you can see around the world. Today, you see a lot of women in the leaderships. Today, you see a lot of women working in very hard uh, specialties in very difficult areas and engage. It makes our speciality more beautiful, make more uh, speciality more pleasure make um, our speciality more and um, delight to do it. And you see that the talk of a women talk, you can see in our microsurgical technique. This world need love. This world need people that really love what to do it. In the neurosurgery, the same way. When you have more people engage and change old paradigm to, to a new, way to live, it will change a lot. It's a great pleasure to me in the Audit Education Committee of the World Federation to have this meeting. Today is Tuesday. Our common day is Saturday morning. Maria asked me to change to Tuesday. I know that Tuesday is a work day to everybody. But thank you, thank you for all of you to be here. Professor Nelsi, thank you to take your time. Luana, Professor Fayette, and please enjoy the webinar. I think it will be very nice to all of us. Thank you. Nelsi, please. Please go ahead. Morning. Thank you very much, uh, Borba and Nor, for these kind words. It's a privilege for me to be here and share uh, some experience uh, in neurosurgery and neuroradiology will be a little bit different than usual, this uh, lecture, more personal maybe. And uh, thanks and congratulations for all the women that are with us on this stage uh, this morning. The role of neurosurgeons on neuroradiology through the time, uh, the personal experience, uh, the agenda is who uh, we need to talk a little bit about pioneers and probably this lecture will be the introduction for all the, the next speakers. And the second part is about my personal experience on this. Uh, the only certainty we have in life is the constant change and uh, always we are changing our uh, behavior and uh, the life. When we start, who is uh, the first uh, pioneer? It's uh, Röntgen. Uh, he uh, discovered the X-ray. Why X-ray? Because is the nature, the unknown uh, nature of uh, this radiation. It was in 1895. 
and uh, with uh, the hand of his wife, after uh, 15 minutes standing, it was possible to see uh, the bones. And uh, this changed the medicine for life. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1901 in physics. He was the lab in, the, in his house. And uh, at the beginning, the relationship wasn't accepted for uh, his family, but uh, the love win uh, again for both. And uh, the new era uh, start after uh, this discovery, but it was the, during the uh, first world war that uh, the X-ray was using to see the bodies, the bullets and the intracranial contents uh, during these uh, times. Even today, the X-ray is very important for uh, these uh, anatomical anomalies like interparietal foramens or in this pathology, uh, cranial synostosis associated with uh, skeletal anomalies, hypophosphatasia. And also in the emergence room, we need to have some knowledge about X-ray to do this uh, difference. Osteogenesis imperfecta in the left side and uh, non-accidental injury in the right side. The neuroradiologist not necessarily are with you in the, the, the emergence room. You need to have some uh, knowledge about and uh, other paradig paradigmas uh, was changed uh, at the beginning of, of the 19th. Uh, Einstein established the equivalence between matter and energy and the elementary particles not visible or subatomic particles uh, who are, uh, start in, in the way to talking about uh, the world and talking about uh, what we are living. With Planck, the energy, the electricity uh, came new words into it, quanta electron, uh, protons, and the radioactivity is uh, a new field to be discovered and to use for the humanity. And uh, Max Planck and Ab Albert Einstein was uh, together, but uh, Einstein won uh, the Nobel Prize in physics in 1921 for the photoelectric effects. And the neuroradiology stay more than 20 years after Röntgen discovery to start to put these uh, X-rays in the neurology. The paradigm uh, always uh, spent some time to be accepted and start to discuss. And uh, after X-ray uh, three decades, Egas Muniz from Portugal developed the, the way to see the vessels inside uh, the skull. And uh, with a percutaneous uh, technique, but uh, for him, the best results was opening uh, the neck and expose uh, the carotid artery to have this canalization and change for life also the way we saw uh, our brain else in our uh, vessels. Uh, Egas Muniz uh, win the Nobel Prize, but wasn't uh, about uh, angiography, was about leukotomy in certain uh, psychosis. The other marker in the history is Godfrey Hausfield from UK. He won uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, and he was electrical engineer. Uh, he became interested in computers and developed the concept of uh, tomography and introduced the whole body of scanner in the 75. And uh, the new era, uh, the CT scan at uh, the beginning, it was very, very slow, uh, two sections in 10 minutes, but it was uh, much better than X-ray and uh, only and geography for certain pathologies. And in the 80s, uh, the MRI uh, have a new revolution. If, even if the beginning it was 1.5 uh, Tesla and then require 1.5 hour uh, each slice. And the gadolinium contrast uh, do a 
again, a new changement, uh, the way we see uh, the brain, we see the small uh, vessels here that we can uh, relate and link to the uh, malformation. And the question with the MRI now is uh, maybe uh, the angiography can be a substitute now for other uh, options. Probably not, uh, like we see here in the AVM. Uh, to see the vessels inside the brain, it was yesterday a lecture from Professor uh, Ferix, Ferix Shadad, uh, the chair of the neurosurgery at the university. Uh, it was uh, shows that is uh, the arteriography need to be continued, or he is the gold standard even today. Sure, we can have uh, the tomography with uh, the vessels, but uh, there isn't the same uh, quality like we see here. Is almost uh, the perfection is the anatomy we can see. And uh, the second part is about uh, Nelson's unknown relationship with uh, this uh, neurosurgery and neuroradiology. Why neuroradiology uh, came uh, into my life? At the beginning, it was at the University of Caxias do Sul in the South. Uh, Dr. Paulo Ricardo Matana was my uh, inspiration, is uh, still today. Uh, we discuss about uh, myelography, about angiography, and uh, during my holidays, I spend uh, some time in Porto Alegre, is the capital of uh, Rio Grande do Sul. And during this internship, uh, volunteer during my holidays, I know these uh, very uh, kind people, Professor Nelson Pires Ferreira, the uh, chief of uh, the neurosurgery in the San Jose Hospital, Santa Casa, and these two uh, residents at that time. Uh, today, they are neurosurgeon, uh, Jose Calvario Sena in France and Carlos Bastos in Salvador. Uh, they showed me, I was a medical student, I saw uh, they performing uh, encephalography, uh, the same pneumocephalogram that Walter Dundee described. I was so impressed that uh, I fall, uh, I decided at that time that will be my life uh, on this uh, field. And my uh, colleagues uh, at the university, we start with uh, 60 uh, colleagues. At the end, we was 40. And uh, no, uh, no one chose uh, neurosurgery uh, except myself. And after uh, this uh, medical student uh, finished, now we are a physician. Uh, how we can choose? Stay there and just work or keep it going? And uh, the residence uh, there in Santa Casa, it was my dream at the beginning, but uh, it was close to my hometown, but it was impossible. Uh, there is no place uh, at that time for me. And it was necessary to move to Rio de Janeiro and a public hospital, Miguel Couto. It was a big change because in the South, it was uh, a small hospital, a small town, and uh, it was a huge experience in Rio de Janeiro, living inside the hospital, working and living for a year inside the hospital. It was really a change uh, on my life. And after this year internship, uh, the decision was uh, try to do neuroradiology at the University Federal Fluminense or uh, stay in Rio de Janeiro and uh, doing neurosurgery. And between these choices, uh, it was only a bridge, uh, the Ponte Rio Niterói, and also my professional career also. Uh, we need to, to do some changements in life to see. Uh, I was involved in neuroradiology by, uh, by uh, interest, personal interest, but surgery, it was uh, my first uh, intention. When I win the first step in the University Federal 
of uh, Niteroi for uh, neuroradiology, I was uh, balanced my heart uh, about two uh, choices. But when uh, the answer came uh, that I will win also in Rio de Janeiro to, to do in neurosurgery residence, uh, no doubt anymore. We know uh, in, uh, when we feel uh, this inner satisfaction is different, uh, it's difficult to, to transform in words. Uh, it's a, a kind that inner uh, certitude you choose, uh, you decide, but you have inside yourself uh, your barrier and you know when you are right, you feel comfortable and happy with your choice. At this moment, I just start a uh, residency in Rio de Janeiro with uh, Professor uh, José Carlos Lynch. And the third year of residency, the duty uh, came again uh, on my mind, myelography and angiography. It was uh, our day-by-day uh, -day work. And myelography uh, at that time wasn't available uh, neuroradiologist in the hospital. It was the, the neurosurgical residents to do this uh, uh, this investigation, uh, or lumbar puncture or cervical uh, spine uh, by lateral tap and uh, put inside the contrast. And if it was lumbar, it wasn't about uh, guided, but if it was a cervical approach, it was under fluoroscopy uh, to see the superior limit of the lesion before to decide if it's surgical uh, operation or not. In the same time, uh, the neurosurgical resident at that uh, time, third year, uh, mm, mandatory to study neuroradiology and neurosurgery at the same time. And in geography, we start with a direct canalization of uh, carotid artery. And time to time, it was possible to canalization also vertebral artery. I remember one of my worst complication, it was five aneurysm and the, the women came after a geography with uh, several uh, cranial nerve palsy. Fortunately, uh, probably vasospasm, uh, probably uh, she uh, recuperates uh, after uh, clipping this aneurysm. And, uh, and the, these uh, days uh, came into us also the cell digger technique. And it was possible when the catheter was available because uh, working in a low and middle income country, we know that this disposable catheter uh, have a cost and uh, not more uh, reusable, but at that time, it was possible time to time to reutilize uh, these catheters. And uh, the professor of my professor, uh, it was Leonard Mellis that gave us uh, the opportunity to visit Rio de Janeiro once a year. And we are uh, seeing and analyzing uh, the and geography to decide what to do with uh, the patient. And uh, for those that doesn't know about Leonard Mellis, uh, the obituary in Journal of Neurosurgery are described a legend in his own time. It was a very humble uh, neurosurgeon and very meticulous uh, microsurgeon and uh, organized the neurosurgeon microsurgeon uh, microsurgery course in the late uh, 1968. And uh, he developed uh, the Melis uh, bipolar with uh, irrigation that we use since uh, my residency. And uh, at that time, I was uh, the first uh, woman uh, neurosurgeon uh, in this uh, department. And uh, after the residence training, uh, stay and work or keep going to do a fellowship. Uh, choose the best way is a inner decision, is always our ch choices. We can blame others, but it's always our responsibility. We need to take care about our thoughts, our feelings, because uh, the energy we deliver with our thoughts came back to us. And it's important. And I was privileged uh, to visit and to uh, decide to do a fellowship in Besançon, France. 
Uh, it was uh, the greenest uh, city in France still today, and zero waste master plan, just the, the quality of this beautiful city that I uh, got the privilege to be there. And once again, neuroradiology came uh, into my life. Uh, six hours a week I spent in neuroradiology for uh, Two reasons. One, I keep improving my capacity to analyze CT scan uh, in neuroorthopedy. And uh, with uh, Professor Jean Bourneville and uh, Dr. Carmen Navarro, that was my uh, mentor to, to go to France, uh, stay there for all the time, once a week in the Wednesday afternoon, uh, doing uh, neuroradiology. The, First uh, changement we saw uh, comparing high uh, and income country and uh, low and middle income country, it was uh, the availability at that time, uh, the facility 24 hours a day, and not only neurosurgery, but interventionist radiology. Until there, uh, our uh, neuroradiology was only uh, by diagnosis, no by uh, treatment. And I start seeing there uh, the emergency room just start treating aneurysm also by direct approach, microsurgery and or uh, embolization. After this period, I uh, moved to Marseille to do my pediatric neurosurgical fellow with uh, Professor Maurice Schrux, my mentor. And uh, again, uh, the neuroradiologist there, uh, it was uh, Charles Rebaud, fantastic friend uh, to uh, Professor my, uh, Maurice Schrux, but very skilled uh, pediatric neuroradiology. After Marseille period, uh, he moved uh, to Toronto, Canada, when uh, where he stay for a while. And weekly meetings, we uh, learn a lot with this multidisciplinary team. Each child, each, each pathology, uh, the dossier came from different parts of the world and always discussing together once a week uh, what the best way to treat uh, these uh, patients. And for those that doesn't know uh, Charles Rebaud, he is uh, the co-editor with uh, Jane Barkovich on pediatric neuroradiology. And now we have a lot of improvement on MRI. We have a lecture uh, later on on this. Just uh, to put in perspective, uh, both the university uh, uh, improve also. Uh, the university where I do my medical school now is open for foreign students also. And the university, uh, Federal University of Sao Paulo, where I'm working now, also receive foreign students uh, in the lab of uh, micro uh, neurosurgery. The take home message, uh, neuroradiology become first. All neurosurgeons need at least have a basic principles on neuroradiology because in the operating room, you are you and yourself. You don't have your neuroradiologist with you. The anatomy is uh, the first step and radiology the second one to feel comfortable to do your best for uh, each patient. Progress never stop and collaboration is the key. Just some words about uh, the society that I have the privilege. I serve uh, during four years in the Pediatric Neurosurgical Committee until the last year in the World Federation. This society has uh, 50,000 neurosurgeons and uh, is association of the societies. And the difference uh, with uh, the International Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery, we are uh, at least 500 pediatric neurosurgeons. You need to apply yourself. Is an individual uh, membership. Uh, you need to apply and see if it's your uh, desire. And uh, the news now, uh, the 90 days reports for the new uh, administration of the World Federation, the pediatric uh, neurosurgical committee that I was the privilege to serve now is linked to the ISPN, where, where I serve now uh, like a chair of the education committee. I invite you to be with us in Bogota the next March 13 to 18. 
and uh, my uh, gratitude to Professor Schuchs, my mentor. And uh, you are never alone. Uh, keep going. And uh, like we saw in the Rangian, uh, we don't see the X-ray. But if it doesn't see the X-ray, it doesn't mean that it exists. And if you believe, you are not alone. Never. And thanks for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Madam, for the wonderful lecture and the wonderful uh, thoughts you have shared with us today. Again, thank you so much for accepting the invitation to deliver your wonderful talk and share your wonderful um, vision with us. Um, Professor Borbach, I invite you to kindly say a few, few words and introduce Professor Najee al -Abadi. Okay. Thank you, Nelsi. Thank you. You know, the most important life is to follow your dreams. Professor NLC show how her trajectory, the difficulties, the thing you can do many, many years ago to start to do neurosurgery, few women. Now are taking over all the facility. It's a great pleasure to introduce our next president of the World Federation, the great neurosurgeon, great teacher and professor and inspiration for many of us not only for the women, but for the neurosurgeon in general. She's a great surgeon, great teacher, great professor, and great, great humanity. I know that Professor Neja in the next two years in the World Federation will be a change, will be the turning point in our federation. Thank you, Professor Naj Albadi, to be here. I know that you are very busy. Maria, nor Maria, she is almost crying. She's so happy that you are here. And thank you for taking your time. Thank you. Thank Please, you. go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, dear Luis. I will share my, my screen with the, of everybody. And uh, of course, uh, happy uh, Women days, uh, women days, of course, for all uh, women's, but all, also for the for the men's, because the the women day, uh, the, the the women are fighting for women for right of women. It's uh, really it's fighting for the science. So, dear friend and dear colleague, let me first congratulate all the organizer. Uh, on this event for this uh, tremendous work in the uh, in the small time that, and especially during this uh, 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 this special time. Secondly, I am pleased and honored to be associated to this wonderful meeting and very, very happy to see all of my dear friend in good health, even virtually. Thank you very much, Nelsi, Louis, Nor, and Huda, and all, all of you. Uh, to be woman, not just this day, but every day, we need to be strong, we need to be independent, we need to be bold, and we, we, we need to be passionate. So this is not only day, women days, but I, for me, it's, the, it's women of, of neurosciences. So... Um, my my my, uh, my talk today is about invention and in, uh, innovation and uh, global perspectives. If we look in dictionary, the definition of innovation in the improve, improvement of an existing a concept with the new features, innovation is also linked to the massive diffusion of an, an, an invention. Innovation is the transformation or invention by the mind added to its commercial integration. When I propose this talk in my mind, there is no big difference or confusion between invention and innovation, for example. When I went through the literature, I have discovered many controversies concerning the real definitions. I choose only study that it seems for me more closer to reality. This study has demonstrated for the first time, the use of patent and publication data to quantitatively evaluate technological innovations in neurosurgery. Five major technology clusters were identified over the last 50 years. 
image guidance device is the, the topic of today. Clinical neuropsychophysiology devices, neuromodulation devices, operating microscope and endoscopes. Moreover, the growth pattern of these technology clusters over time could be described in terms of diffusion of innovations theory. Image guidance and neuromodulation devices were found to be lying within a phase of exponential growth and as such can be forecast to have an increasing influence in the future of operative neurosurgery. In future studies, the same methodology may be applied to assess more specific technology clusters to assist in forecasting their potential influence. Innovation is heterogeneous concept among neurosurgeons that necessitate or standardization to ensure appropriate patient safety without, without stifling progress. We discussed the ethical drawback of not having a clear definition of innovation, the current challenges in achieving a, a, a unified understanding of innovation in neurosurgery and offer suggestion for uniting the field going uh, uh, forward. Sometimes there is an, an intersection between the, it's two notions like, uh, like schematized on this slide. And the uh, invention, I will give you only, for example, one thing. Uh, the invention, of, for example, of creation of something uh, uh, that was previously not existing and innovation is implementation or uh, uh, introduction, uh, a new, a new characteristic uh, to a uh, uh, product uh, of a field. Sorry. So innovation is at the core of what we do, continually striving for better ways to treat patients. Our surgeons adopt the best technologies and approaches for around the world and contribute may, many innovation of, uh, of their own developing and applying clinical technical, techno, technologies, as you see here, for example, laser, advantage brain imaging, uh, as, as we were discussing today, minimally invasive, et cetera, et cetera, so on. So surgical innovation, for, uh, uh, there is four types. First, minor modification of standard procedure, innovations that are new to the institution, but have been validated elsewhere, uh, third, new indication for validated technique and fourth, major modifications of an established technique or radically new innovation. The difference between invention and innovation, for example, I already said, uh, uh, mentioned that, X-ray, for example, in, as invention, uh, the, 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 the base, it is the base of medical X-ray as innovation. And there is many other examples. So technological innovation within healthcare may be defined as the introduction of new technology that initiate a change in clinical practice. Neurosurgery is particularly technologically intensive surgical discipline and new technologies have pre preceded many uh, of the major adv uh, advances in operative neurosurgical technique. The aim of the present study was to quantitatively evalu evaluate the technological in innovation in neurosurgery, neurosurgery using patent and peer-reviewed publications as metrics of uh, technology development and clinical translation respectively. So how, how do we best navigate the inherent conflict of interest to understand and employ, employ a new devices? The rules include dollar amounts, but is money the source of the difficulties? Uh, how do we introduce new surgical strategies? Surgeons innovate every day. What is the difference between a practical solution and a clinical research? So, Certainly, politically, it gives more credibility for the rulers and the better for us, the scientists. Research is, is, to, see, is uh, to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. 
uh, uh, this is a quote uh, uh, to, uh, of Albert uh, Svensson Georgi. Uh, so the greed and disparate neuroethics. Neuro how about ethics in surgical innovation? So possibly not specific, specifically neuroethics. However, any discussion of radical neurosurgical innovation takes place in the shadow of the legacy of psychosurgery. You see here the, the great uh, books of uh, uh, Elliot Wallenstein. Surgical innovation, how to proceed? Innovation is at the heart of neurosurgery. Too much regulation will start stifle innovation. However, the lack of oversight and systematic research is no longer defendable. Further, interdisciplinary debate uh, like uh, radio, uh, neuroradiologists, radiologists, interventionalists, and neuroanesthetists, etc. They no longer address whether some sort of oversight in, is in necessary, but what type is when appropriate. Surgical innovation, no clear definition of surgical innovation in papers. And ideal collaboration, ideal development, exploration, assessment, long-term follow-up, ideal improvement, the quality, quality of research and surgery. Model that describes stage of innovation in surgery, recommendation at each stage of the model. And I had asked people what they want. They uh, would have said faster horse that, uh, after this is after Henry Ford. And why we need research? Uh, why research is important in medicine? to improve in practice, to develop a new understanding related to the learning, teaching, et cetera. It's also important to help in initiation the action, helps in decision-making and brings consistently, a consistency in the work and moreover, it motivates others. Do we need uh, the money? Is it it's certainly not the right question, neither the answer. We can start by some clinical research, which doesn't need much money. On the other hand, research can generate much more money by creating jobs, by improving the quality of life of citizens, etc. So what about the history in research in neurosurgery? Historically, historically, cerebral surgery results from the first steps in the understanding of brain anatomy and cerebral function between the 18 and 19 centuries. And the research needs a multidisciplinary team, a good knowledge in neuroanatomy, in neurobiology, and so on. Fundamental changes in the conceptual view of the causes of neuro, neurosciences disease was crucial step in the development of neurology and neurosurgery and anesthesia. This is historical link between basic neurosciences and the neurosurgery which becomes narrow, narrower with the evolution and the progress in both fields. So why we need young neurosurgeons from Africa? Of course, I will we give the example of Africa because I know it very well. I am from Africa, as you know, but yet I'm a citizen, a citizen of uh, uh, of world. I'm neurosurgeon of the of, of the world. So, if we wish that one day that this car is homogeneous, we will need our young people to you know to, in, to involve more in all the fields, and especially in neurosurgery, and to develop the research for more clarity. The current status of African neurosurgery is one of the most frustrating aspects of neurosurgery in the 21, 21st century. African countries except the North and the South have no, not benefited from the progress achieved in neurosurgery during the last 50 years. The delay in the development of neurosurgery in Africa is related to many factors, of course. Lack of financial resources and infrastructure, paucity of neurosurgery, inadequate healthcare planning, inadequate political, economic, and social uh, environment. 
This overview of the basic concept of normal neuro, neuronal activity represents a fundamental step for residency program in neurosurgery to facilitate the, the, the understanding of the, neuro, the, the neurosciences, the neurosurgical disease, to have an overview of emergent principles in uh, neurobiology, which are essential for the uh, continuous education and development of neurosurgery. mentor, Professor al Khamnishi, who always says uh, uh, basic neurosurgery are the key to understand the mechanism of nervous system disease, and basic neurosciences are the key to the progress of neurosurgical techniques. Basic neuro, uh, neurosciences are the key for the future development of, neurosur of neurosurgery. So to get resident in neurosurgery used to some subject research in basic neurosciences and the epidemiology and the genetic of our disease, our needs or, and our research, re research, our healthcare protocol of our continent is very different for other continents. This is why we need research made in Africa for Africans by African neurosurgeons. Why we need your neurosurgeon to do research in Africa, for example. In thinking about how to deal with this subject, I thought it would be opportunity to listen to young people uh, how think about research in our discipline. And the answer summarized by my collaborator, Dr. Pader Kawi, is as follows. When you decide to start a research, it's about seeking for knowledge and test, therefore, is a, a, a ultimate goal of a solving a problem. You imagine an MIT lab or an IBM discussion group. Uh, after all, it is all about asking questions and finding answer. Finding, uh, answer. They will like the view and the adventure for sure in the, in the beginning. They will uh, be fulfilled of their dream and keep their goal always on the focus, on the focus, then they will get tired with no more solutions, idea or water. They will stop moving and people observers uh, will think that they are losing time. They are not serious. They, are, they, can, uh, they cannot imagine that they just trying to find connection to the network. They believe that in their lab laboratory, they have all what they need to make it. They don't know that in Africa, even basic needs are not offered for research in the most of time. And so cast uh, away, they will look for help for someone to, to talk to. Uh, they will to try textbooks, webinars, TEDx, other experiences. And maybe they will decide to stop fighting and challenging until one day they will be able to make it. Because in the most of time, it is a challenge. It is mandatory to finish, to have a career achievement. After, after all, this is what they the, the say. So what many questions arises, it just one step. Uh, will they continue? Is it uh, worthy? Uh, one only encouragement who will make this young neurosurgeon and researcher stick on research attitude. They need the button support of their keyboard and help each other to achieve his or her goal. We are the women of the day. Work and live in a synergy, find solution together. Young researchers need a minimum of, um, a minimum of, of infrastructure, need correct to tools with a group support, a research team, uh, to learn research in the correct way and have value, valuable results. After all, falls with the tools still falls, with, with, uh, as we said. Finally, after this outstanding reflection, we all are looking for, to bridge the gap and reach the other side of knowledge. We need advancement to still exist as a humankind. And we should support the young neuro, neurosurgeon and researcher to be able to cut the correct cable on the right time. Young neurosurgeon needs us to facilitate all this uh, thought route. 
and we need the young neurosurgeon to continue doing research and do it early. We need to we need their energy to advance the neurosurgical care for human kind. And why do we need research for Africa? Let me give you some Moroccan example. First one was epidemiological research, which is done in the early 19s. Uh, his is incidence of cerebral aneurysm in Morocco, for example, common belief on low incidence of cerebral aneurysm in Africa. And incidence of cerebral aneurysm in Morocco between 1960 and 1970, rarity in, in or in existence of aneurysm. Between 1970 and 1980, one to three cases per year. But when um, Professor Hamnishi uh, gave the chance to the, 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 the young team researcher between 1980 and 1982, autopsy study of 250 very, uh, 100 adults, 100 children, and 50 fetus, we the incidence of cerebral aneurysm in autopsy series is not different and, uh, 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 again, what happened in literature. Autopsy studied of 250 brain uh, 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 find uh, more than 1% cerebral aneurysm. No specific morphology of the arterial circle of Willis. So your brain will not be the same, of course, uh, this another work conducted by a neuro neurosurgical team in our university, Abulkasis in Rabat, about Parkinson's disease. I will go back. I know that I take a lot of, lot of time. They conclude the evidence for prehistoric origin of the one of the gene mutation in the North African Berber population. And your brain will not be the same. We know that. So economic impact of gene generic drug, for, for example, test. Generic drug is the good way of development country. For example, in USA, 80% of treatment with generic drugs. In Morocco, only 30% with this type of drugs. And in Africa, all of Africa, only seven countries began this, began this strategy. So situation of generic study in Abu Qasis University, my university, it's beginning of protocol test of 2016, 20 studies, two audit procedure, and accreditation of more than uh, 70,100 uh, ongoing and ongoing uh, studies. So research protocol model in neurosurgical disease adapted to African countries. This is my message. Scope of the dilemma, research is a global business. Founders and international organizations, agencies, industries, a world is, world is of diverse economic cultures and tradition. Africa is a continent with limited resource. 33 of 50 world poorest country are in Africa. Can we apply research in low and limited research context? For world to uh, for world to conduct research with zero dollar conduct study in quality of life knowledge attitude and practice focus group and quality qualitative assessment etc perform assessment research by using standardization and referential tools. While a way to forward to, co to conduct research with zero dollar also is developing expertise in literature review, systematic review, and so on, explore and analyzing existing databases as registers, databases, hospital files, etc. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, the current neurosurgical armamentarium is a result of multidisciplinary teams gathered by visionary pioneers all over the world. So modern neurosurgery is a property of mankind and should be at the reach of all human, humans in the world. And neurosurgical training, that basic training is not the only goal of the, this project, for example, in Rabat Reference Center. We should give uh, to uh, African neurosurgeon its own development capacity for the future by introducing young African neurosurgeon to research in frequent pathologies in Africa, support. The, man, the, the supported by the, for, for example, Mediterranean Association, which connected geographically and professionally Africa to Europe. 
So today, a complex problem of neurosurgery disease needs a, color, a colloquium between researchers and clinicians because clinical and scientific approaches are complementary. Merit of research, understanding the nature and purpose of research, complete the, dis the disclosure of aims and objectives, methodologies, expected risk and, auto, uh, and outcome of research, effective communication and publications. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm so sorry if, if, I, will, if uh, I, I was so long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for a wonderful Thank talk. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. You know, uh, the research is the basis of everything. But the most important to us for, for human beings is to follow your ideas. Yeah. Sometimes you have the idea, see, you don't try to continue and try to realize these ideas. I remember one uh, Professor Vinko Dolink. Everybody yeah. was removing the enterocleinoid by his intradural. But he had the idea to remove extradural and change everything in the skull base in the area for <laughs> aneurysm, for tumor, for things. Very simple idea that why he had this idea and he followed his idea. The young neurosurgeon, the young doctor, and everyone, if you follow our ideas, maybe you can go to somewhere. And training, professor, is everything. I know the work that you are doing in Africa. We need to do this more, 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 not only Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. Yeah. We need to train. There is no more time to train in the head of somebody. There is no more time to train in the patient. We need to train to, to models, to labs, to training, to, to watch, to see Inception. the mentors. This is the most important thing. And the passion for neurosurgery has, always has to be alive. It's make us different as a speciality. It's the passion for what he, we do. Thank you, Professor, for outstanding presentation and very inspiring lecture to all of us. I appreciate. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Professor Luis Verba, for these uh, kind words. And I absolutely, uh, I totally agree with you. When you have, a, 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 for example, for the pioneer, for the seniors, if I can see that, it's when you have an idea, you have to follow your idea till the, the end. But for the beginners, for the youngers, we need to give them uh, you know, a, a strategy to how to uh, st start research and how to, to continue to be uh, strong and strong in the, in the future. Thank you so much for your uh, comment, uh, comment. It's very interesting also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Please, Nor, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Nadir Alamadi. It was a matter of great honor and pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk and all the wonderful points that you have highlighted. So, Mixi, Buku, uh, let me introduce my our, another speaker, uh, Professor Fozia Sajad. Um, I'm honored to tell you that she is my one of my own mentors. So, it's a matter of great honor and I'm really feeling overwhelmed to welcome her here. She's the first professor of first woman professor of neurosurgery in Pakistan and she's also the chair of the Vince chapter of PSN that is the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgery. She has um, several things under her belt that includes that she's the first woman uh, Pakistani neurosurgeon who has acquired an FRCS degree um, in addition to the FCPS degree. FCPS is considered the highest possible specialty training program. Uh, I'm a part of that FCPS training program. Like I've mentioned before, I've completed my training for FCPS neurosurgery and she's uh, done first FTPS neurological surgery and then she moved to uh, Saudi Arabia where she worked under the guidance supervision of the legendary professor Imad Kinan and later on uh, she served as she got back to Pakistan to serve the nation where she served as associate professor in neurosurgery and I think in a very short time she's one of the youngest uh, people who have been promoted as a professor uh, in public sector in the government and um, this, uh, this year she 
she has been promoted as the first neurosurgery professor, women uh, professor of neurosurgery in Pakistan. She is now heading the unit in South Court Medicine uh, Medical College, Court of the Medical College. So um, it's an honor for me to invite her um, on stage. Madam, the stage is all yours now. Uh, so Hello, everyone. You? So no, I am grateful so to the to organizing be... committee for inviting me for this talk. Thank and you, I'm Professor. really thankful to Noor for such a nice introduction and for giving me opportunity to talk in the constellation of beautiful and brainy ladies like Ma'am Najia and uh, Nelsi and Sir <laughs> Barbara. Thank you so much. I believe that a competent neurosurgeon must have good neuroradiological command, not only for the purpose of uh, diagnosis, but for proper, precise, pre-operative planning for the surgical excision of the lesion. Today, I will throw light on the CT brain, magnetic resonance imaging, MR spectroscopy, and radio genomics. CT brain is a good diagnostic tool. We know it is the representation of the different projections of body. So the internal organs or the internal or parts of the body can be presented by projection of different images. The beam of light outside the body that rotates around the body from different angles, the beam of light is passed through the different tissues they absorb that and then they are detected by the electronic detector and a projection is formed. In that way, this is uh, uh, really a blessing, the CT brain. And that, uh, as a result of that, the neurosurgery achieved its milestones. That was first uh, devised and designed by G.F. Hounsfield in 1969 for that he was uh, awarded Nobel Prize in 1979. Thus, X-ray beams, as they are absorbed by the different parts, different tissues of the body, and the degree of absorption is variable in different parts. The parts of the tissues having the highest content of the protein, they appear as hyperattenuated, while those having maximum water content, they appear as hypoattenuated, means more white. So different shades of the uh, gray, they represent different things. The brain matter is utilized as a reference. White matter has plus 30 Hounsfeld unit, while gray matter plus 45. And there is a wide range of Hounsfeld unit from air till bone calcification from minus 1000 till plus 1000. This is the normal CT brain. Here we can see the ventricles are normal. The gray white demarcation is quite visible. The sulci and gyri, they are normal bilaterally. The bone is fine. The soft tissue details are fine. As actually, uh, as a general principle, the first um, any for any purpose, always focus on the normal physiology of the brain and then move towards the pathology and then the other anatomical details like the bone, soft tissues, or the sinuses. Here we can see, we know that the brain actually gives the picture in different slices and in different segments. Now the neurosurgeon has to make a complete picture in total by making a three-dimensional picture according to the different segments. Here, this is a supratentorial segment. We can see this white matter track, the centrum semi-oval that can move from uh, frontal towards the posterior direction, frontal lobes, and then this is the parietal lobe. This is again another a supratentorial segment at the level of foramen of Monroe, the frontal horns, the third ventricle. There is the globus pallidus, the posterior limb of internal capsule, and here is the um, head of the quadrate nucleus. 
there are certain uh, things for the residents that they must remember that anything lateral to the third ventricle would be the um, thalamus, then the posterior limb of external uh, internal capsule. This would be the inter anterior limb of internal capsule between the frontal horn and anterior limb of internal capsule will be the corded nucleus. Here will be the globus pallidus and cotamen. There will be the external capsule. In this, the third ventricle is more evident and uh, the other anatomical details in the same way. This is the segment at the level of the midbrain. The tactical plate is visible. This is the quadrigeminal cistern. The sylvian fissure is visible here and this is the frontal lobe here. Then more down at the level of the pons, the fourth ventricle is visible. This is the uh, middle cerebral peduncle by which the pons is adherent with the cerebellum. And uh, uh, this is the temporal fossa. This is the saphenoid sinus. Here in this uh, uh, segment at the level of the medulla oblong beta, this is the petrous bone, cerebellar hemisphere, fourth ventricle. And this is the infratemporal fossa showing the muscles of mastigations. Next, please. CT brain is excellent for uh, trauma. It's excellent to uh, diagnose and to have a view of the blood, spontaneous or traumatic. In trauma, the extradural, this is the extradural having the typical biconvex shape. We can appreciate the midline shift. We can uh, here appreciate the effacement of the lateral ventricles. And uh, this is a picture of the subdural hematoma, the sickle shape, the typical picture with marked midline shift and loss of the gyri and sulci, loss of the uh, most of the demarcation of the gray and white matter. Here, this is possibly due to the spontaneous bleed in the basal ganglion, this uh, having the extension into the lateral ventricle. The uh, blood is seen in the frontal horn as well as in the occipital horn. This is the spontaneous bleed in the basal systems. All the basal systems are full, even the blood in the sylvian fissure. The, here we can appreciate the midline shift and uh, effacement of ventricles, and there is loss of the gyri and, and sulci on uh, the side of the brain. So uh, either the trauma or in even in the case of the spontaneous bleed, the CT scan is a um, diagnostic choice for the neurosurgeons. The blood actually, according to the degradation product of the heme, it changes its shape according to the, uh, with the passage of time. For it initial, at the time of bleed, it's hyperdense, but gradually, over a period of uh, seven to 10 days, it becomes iso intense and later on, but here we can appreciate the gyre and sulci are not evident here. And with further progression of time, it will change into a more denser and black and form. The hypo uh, dense blood is evident here. Not only the blood and uh, the trauma, this is also very good for hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is basically the dilatation of the ventricles. There is effacement of the gyrine sulci, effacement of the interhemispheric fissure, more evident here, and the effacement of the sylvian fissure as well. The periventricular leucency is evident in hydrocephalus. The uh, third ventricle is ballooned here. The temporal horns are evident. All the ventricular systems, they are dilated. And probably in that case, the temporal horns are evident, but fourth ventricle is not so much dilated. Probably this is a case of obstructive hydrocephalus. The uh, hydrocephalus is basically, in general, is diagnosed with all these features, with dilated ventricular system, periventricular leucencies. When the frontal horns are dilated, and the ratio of the dil maximum dilated part of the frontal horn with that of the internal diameter, here at this point, ratio should be more than 0.5. Or 
it should be the frontal horn diameter with the interparietal diameter. If the ratio is more than 30%, then it is uh, confirmed that the patient has hydrocephalus. One thing I want to mention is that, that uh, it's not necessary that uh, always the ventricles should be dilated. The most important point in the clinical practice of neurosurgeon is that the, if a patient has hydrocephalus and patient has uh, operated for a CSF diversion procedure, in that case, always use the, that scan as a reference uh, in which the ventricles are, uh, um, when patient is clinically well, means um, uh, if in that scan, the ventricles are uh, smaller in size, even uh, next time when the patient will present with headache and vomiting for hydrocephalus, you have to compare with that uh, scan at which the patient was clinically well. Uh, uh, means these are all the theoretical and good knowledge for that, but clinically you have to make a reference after a uh, CSF diversion procedure. CT is also good for detection of the calcification. Calcification could be physiological. Many times the pineal gland has uh, calcification or uh, the choroid plexus become calcified. There could be calcification in the basal ganglion. Normally, it is accepted that if the pineal region gland has calcification less than one centimeter, or in other words, less than 10 mm, then it's considered physiological. If more than one centimeter, always think for any pathological lesion. We can look for the pathological calcification as well. Here, there is collection of calcification. There are chances maybe there is another underlying pathology that is responsible for that, uh, maybe underlying tumor, oligodendrogliomas, etc. Sometimes the calcifications are in the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle, and uh, um, these are basically the calcified tubers in uh, tuberous sclerosis. And uh, 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 in that case, in other uh, a CT scan picture, we must look for at the foramen of Monroe for uh, subependymal giant cell um, uh, append uh, ependymoma. These are very typical and pathognomonic of the uh, uh, this uh, tram, uh, tram track uh, calcification in which the patient can be uh, having stroge weber syndrome. So calcification, uh, uh, hydrocephalus, and uh, bleed, they are the good component which we can identify on any CT scan. Brain can also give information about the bony tumors, about the masses. Here on the CT scan, we can identify that there are areas of uh, hypoattenuation probably this is the out of proportion edema, and uh, this is uh, probably a bleed. We can suspect, yes, this could be a ble uh, bleeding met, means multiple metastasis in the brain and bleed in one of them. No doubt, from one slice, we will not make our impression. We have to uh, look for the whole slices and uh, reconfirm and utilize the MRI, which we will discuss later on. Here, the uh, CT brain, it's giving us information that there is a contrast enhancing lesion. This contrast enhancing lesion has a, having perifocal edema and probably this could be a high grade glioma. Here we can appreciate a mixed uh, attenuated, mixed uh, density lesion that is probably crossing the midline and uh, uh, this could be a glioma as well and the remaining brain showing the signs of the edema as well. The, uh, as we already discussed, the uh, best uh, CT is best for the bony details. Here we can uh, look for here, there is uh, increased and in, uh, high density lesion. This could be an intraosseous meningioma called the burned out meningioma or could be the uh, a bony lesion 
uh, hair in the brain. So brain can be read or the radiological information can be extracted from different windows, from brain window, from bony window, or even for the soft tissue window. According to the requirement, we can change or scroll in the different windows to get maximum information. The bony anatomy is best read by the bone windows. In the bone windows, the, um, we can, this is very helpful, and I must say extremely helpful for the base of skull. Here, even we can identify the Vidian canal. We can identify, uh, this is the clivus. Here, this is the carotid canal. And this, uh, in, uh, this is the impression for the jugular bulb. Here is the sigmoid, um, uh, 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 the sinus. So these uh, Petrus moon information are very helpful for the um, uh, surgical excision of the lesion that are adjacent to that area in cholesteatoma, Petrus apex lesions. They are extremely helpful for drilling of the Petrus and all these um, the surgical excision. Here we can appreciate the inferior orbital fissure. This uh, is the foramen lacerum, and this beautiful is the foramen uh, ovale. The foramen ovale just behind and almost uh, usually it's behind and lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate. And surgeon uh, wish to see that foramen ovale for injection uh, for uh, trigeminal neuralgia and the x-rays. Here we can appreciate a beautiful foramen ovale. Behind that is the foramen spinosum. Here, the carotid canal. This is the area of the jugular bulb. So lots of anatomical bony details can be achieved with the help of the bony window. The sinuses, they can be uh, seen um, in axial slices. Uh, like these are the frontal sinuses. These are the ethmoid sinuses. These, this is the uh, maxillary sinus. And this is the sphenoid sinus. The surgeon use the uh, CT fast pro protocol. That is nothing. Uh, that is just the 3D reconstruction of the brain win bone window of the CT brain. This is to look for the uh, defect in the uh, for CSF rhinorrhea. Here we can appreciate this is a cribriform plate. Here middle terminate attached with the lateral lamella. This is fovea ethmoidalis. These are the common sites for the uh, CSF rhinorrhea after trauma. And uh, here more uh, details are there. This is the beautiful lateral lamella. This is the cribriform plate, the crystal galley. This is the fovea ethmoidalis. And uh, um, this is the roof of the orbit. The, not only it identify from where the uh, uh, CSF is coming, but it also guides whether the surgeon has to um, select the uh, transphenoidal uh, approach or the transcranial approach for the repair of that CSF rhinorrhea. When the CT scan is uh, um, added with the uh, contrast, then CT angiography and the angiography, the vascular details we can um, uh, learn, uh, we can uh, see the uh, in, uh, anatomical detail of the vasculature of the brain. This um, is the anterior cerebral artery, and here these are the two A2s, here the MCA, and uh, these, this is the PCA, here definitely will be the uh, basilar artery. So it will give us lots of information from which uh, we can know much about the vasculature of the brain. Even these are the veins. This is the straight sinus, vein of gallon. And here, this is the internal cerebral vein. And uh, here are the arteries. The again, A2s are there. And then all the vasculature. And this is the basal artery. The CT angiography, uh, this is very helpful, especially in the developing countries like in our country where the angiography is very expensive. From such images, we can scroll them uh, on our packs and rotate a 3D impression, uh, 3D image. 
uh, by scrolling them, we can identify that this is the aneurysm at the bifurcation of MCA. And uh, uh, even by uh, rotating them, it will give us lots of information about the neck, about the dome, about the perforator originating from them. As this is the 2D picture, uh, but in the 3D rotational image, we can know much about the vascular anatomy. And uh, we routinely operate in our country on uh, just on the CT angio because it's cheaper uh, and provided by the government. And we are used to uh, um, utilize this investigation and can operate patient very safely. Here, this is, uh, I'm sorry, it is slightly tilted. Here we can appreciate a small ACOM aneurysm. And these are the two uh, A2s. This is the A1. And again, we can um, rotate them, scroll them, and can get a 3D picture and can get lots of information from them. The basic disadvantage of the CTE is that in general, the CT brain is not good for the posterior fossa and for the midline structures. But uh, besides that, there are um, uh, certain problems or errors. As a result of that, we cannot get the actual picture of brain on uh, uh, CT uh, due to different either the movement of uh, um, the object or the movement of any metallic object or uh, like the surgical clips or bullets or uh, uh, as a result of the, uh, uh, these, uh, these can produce the beam hardening effect, the st uh, streak artifact and motion artifacts and all these, they can be overcome by removing these objects. And if it's not possible, like in the case of the um, aneurysmal clipping, then other investigation of choice we can you, uh, use them. CT brain in general is excellent for the hydrocephalus, for bleed, for uh, uh, trauma patients, and for uh, uh, bony details of the patient. The magnetic resonance imaging. This magnetic resonance imaging is really the diagnostic tool in neurosurgery. It's uh, non-invasive and uh, it's painless. Here, a big magnet, the basic principle is that a magnet is present around the body. This magnet produces a magnetic field. As a result of that, the nuclei in the body, they align in the direction of that. And uh, um, when the radio frequency waves, uh, they are generated by the machine, as a result of that, the low energy water molecule, they absorb energy and they move with the rhythm and in the direction of that magnetic vector. When the radio frequency uh, waves, this switches off, then they uh, lose that energy and move back to their original position. This movement is actually detected and uh, sent to the computer for making an image. And in that way, the excellent soft tissue details about the vasculature, about the brain tissues can be achieved by with the help of the magnetic resonance imaging. The magnetic resonance um, imaging has different sequences. It's extremely important to know the important characteristics of different sequences. And thus a neurosurgeon must know that which sequence is best to detect uh, the common abnormalities. In general, five to six sequence are routinely utilized to identify the anatomical details of the brain. If we know the qualities and characteristics of different sequences, then we can uh, order a proper protocol of the MRI for a given lesion. Uh, this is the T1 sequence. The T1 sequence is uh, for the anatomical detail of the uh, uh, brain. In this uh, T1 sequence, basically, the um, gray matter is gray and white matter is white. So uh, it means the gray matter is darker than white matter and uh, um, the CSF is black. 
the fat is white. In the T2-weighted image uh, or the T2-weighted sequence, the gray matter is lighter than the white matter. The white matter is darker than the gray matter. The CSF is whitish in color. So these sequences, uh, in general, for uh, any um, evaluation, for evaluation of a reading of the MRI, we must look for the fat, what, uh, it's white, it's uh, uh, then for the fluid, the CSF is black or white, it will give us glue, and the best glue is the gray and the white matter, which will tell us whether this is a T1 weighted sequence or a T2 weighted sequence. In general, on T1, the blood, melanin, they are, and the fat, they appear white in color. There are different sequences, and uh, every sequence has its own significance. It will give us a lot of information. The diffusion weighted and ADC uh, maps, these are basically according, uh, they rely on the movement of the water molecule. And this diffusion weighted image, it will give us information whether the diffusion is restricted or not. The diffusion is restricted in case of the acute stroke up till five to seven days. It's restricted in certain uh, uh, um, uh, pathologies like an abscess. It's restricted in uh, cases of uh, the epidermoid. So we can differentiate them from the arachnoid cells. It is very important. It's a uh, uh, diffusion weighted image is almost same as uh, 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 the, uh, the T2 weighted image, except that uh, the water is, uh, uh, here we have to, uh, null, uh, the water is nullified and uh, we have to look for the restricted uh, diffusion. Uh, for example, to establish whether this diffusion is restricted or not, it's necessary that it must be confirmed on ADC map. If it's not, if suppose it's restricted here, white, white in color, and it's not black here, it means this is not true restriction. It is T2 shine through. So it's necessary to uh, counter check it on ADC image. One sequence is fat suppressed. In the fat suppressed image, the fat is nullified. When the fat is nullified, so it would be helpful to determine certain pathologies where, where the fat content will be more in the body, like at the base of skull, in the orbit. It will be quite helpful when it will suppress the fat, the contrast enhancing lesion can be identified and exact anatomical detail of that pathology can be determined. Here, this pathology, we are able to determine because the fat is suppressed. It's also very helpful in base of skull, it's like in cases of the carotid dissection. When the fat is suppressed, as a result of that, the blood and the um, dissected vessel will enhance uh, and we can detect, oh, this is dissected carotid. The flare. The flare image is uh, uh, basically the T2 weighted image in which the fluid is nullified. This flare uh, image, it will give excellent information about the lesions in the periventricular area. So when the flare will, uh, the fluid, the CSF will be nullified, then we can look for the pathology of the um, the borders of the uh, that pathology. For a uh, uh, fluid to be nullified, it's extremely important that its quantity must be higher up. It can be nullified in the CSF, in the ventricles. It can be nullified in blood. It can be nullified in the uh, cystic tumor, but it cannot be nullified in the edematous brain. So the edema will appear white even on that. So uh, the uh, cortical, subcortical lesions, even in degenerative uh, uh, demyelinating diseases and in the periventricular area lesions, this is quite helpful 
to determine the exact anatomy of that lesion. The susceptibility weighted image, uh, uh, these uh, sequences are relatively newer ones. They are uh, basically to detect the hemorrhage and the blood products. This is excellent to determine the amyloid angiopathy the, on the surface of the brain. They appear as black uh, uh, for uh, the cavernomas, they are very good. The gradient echo, um, uh, they are um, just the older form of the susceptibility uh, um, uh, images. Here, the cavernomas can be detected, but the small hemosedrine or the small blood uh, to detect is relatively difficult. Besides that, there are many other images as well, like the, the contrast images. In the contrast image, the basically the either the uh, 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 this uh, vessel will be enhanced or uh, the sinuses will enhance. But the best thing to look for a, uh, a contrast enhanced lesion is to have a look in the uh, nasal mucosa of the terminate enhance and it will give us information that this is the contrast enhancing lesion. Uh, and I want to mention one other uh, sequence that is a 3D uh, T2 weighted image in which the uh, uh, most of the nerves we can detect. And uh, it's also known as Fiesta. And uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the picture of that. And here, uh, these are the like the CT brain, the MRI, uh, Uh, the MRI, it also gives information in the segments or slices. It's much better than CT in determining the inequitical details. The gyra and sulci are so beautifully, um, can be identified on the MRI. Here, uh, this is the area of the corpus callosum, and uh, um, here the frontal lobe is visible. The superior frontal gyrus is visible. This is the occipital area, the frontal lobe, the temporal horns. This is the head of the quadrate nucleus, as we discussed before. Anything lateral to the um, uh, frontal horn of the lateral ventricle is the head of the quadrate nucleus. This is probably the uh, external capsule, uh, the globus pallidus and putamen. This is the posterior limb of internal capsule. And here is the thalamus. Here, the vessels are enhancing probably in the roof of the third ventricle, the internal cerebral vessels. Here is the central, uh, uh, this uh, motor strip is here. And uh, this is the occipital area. Here, uh, the sinus, the superior sagittal sinus is visible here. The, at the level of the midbrain, the uh, substantia nigra, even it's visible here. The aqueduct of sylvius. The tegmentum and tectal plates are quite visible. This is vessel in the Indian cistern. This is the uh, um, MCA in the sylvian fissure. And uh, these are the um, uh, base, the um, um, uh, frontal lobe. And here the maxillary sinuses are evident. This is at the level of the middle oblongata. And uh, the here, the sinus will be there, the cerebellar hemisphere, and uh, all the anatomical detail. The MRI is better um, that it routinely, not only it gives the information about the soft tissue detail, it gives information in T2 weighted image. We can visualize the blood vessels very nicely with enhancement. We can see the uh, vessels. It always provides a three-dimensional picture, the sagittal and the coronal view. They are quite helpful in determining um, where the lesion is and uh, um, how we have to approach that, uh, whether it's accessible or not. This is very nice. MRI is helpful in determining the uh, central sulcus. The central sulcus can be identified by two or three ways. One way is to identify the superior frontal uh, sulcus. This is the superior frontal gyrus, superior frontal sulcus. 
and it will attach with the precentral sulcus so uh, any sulcus behind that would be the central sulcus and this would be the motor strip it's more evident here in the same way so according to that uh, formula uh, uh, this would be the uh, central sulcus and this would be the motor strip on lateral view sagittal view again uh, uh, here this m sign and t uh, or the t sign we can identify this uh, central sulcus and the uh, motor strip here we can identify it with the form of reverse omega or uh, we can identify it from the bracket sign anything any sulcus anterior to that bracket is the central sulcus so as the soft tissue details the gyri and sulci everything is more defined on the um, uh, mri so it's very easy to identify the central sulcus and this is very helpful for the neurosurgeon when the tumors are in the vicinity of the motor strip uh, although now different other modalities are helpful and uh, i think another speaker will discuss the diffusion tensor image and all that but however this uh, um, uh, mri gives us some idea about the central sulcus and motor strip brain can uh, detect infarction uh, infarction on the brain on t1 and t2 they are not good for the detection of the infarction infarctions are better they can be detected on the ct when they have uh, in watershed areas in territorial areas there will be in uh, they can be better detected there on the um, mri they are uh, best to be detected within minutes on diffusion weighted image and uh, after few hours they can be detected on flare image so um, if uh, in uh, infarction is evident on the diffusion weighted image the shows restriction and there is no hyper intense signal on the flare means there is diffusion and flare mismatch it means this is the time where the uh, we can give the uh, medication to the patient to save the area of penumbra as we all know the tissue plasminogen activator can be given after the onset within 4 and a half hours and flare image shows hyper attenuation after um 3 to 6 hours so uh, but the diffusion weighted image will be helpful in detecting the infarct within minutes otherwise t1 and t2 they are not good for detection of hemorrhage and uh, for detection of the infarction regarding this uh, brain uh, uh, hemorrhage uh, again for hemorrhage the ct brain is best to uh, find out um, the that hemorrhage is there although on ct the brain uh, the blood changes its uh, attenuation according to the time as we discussed earlier it's difficult here to uh, detect um hemorrhage but uh, uh, whether this is acute sub acute every uh, at different stages the hemorrhage appears different according to the composition of the hemoglobin met hemoglobin whether intracellular or extracellular or hemosiderin deposition according to that but it's very simple to remember for the students to they can remember that for in the hyper acute i bleed b means bright i die dark it means uh, here in t1 will be iso and b bright in the t2 here iso and dark and bleed and die bleed bleed and die die this is very uh, a simple words we can remember and um, it's easy to memorize how the blood will appear in different like this is iso and uh, uh, hy uh, hyper so it means this is hyperacute 
iso and hypo it means this is acute this is uh, hyper and hypo it means this is early subacute hyper hyper it is late subacute this is just for memorizing purpose for the resident i put the slide and uh, as simple as that for hemorrhage the best is ct as uh, the uh, on mri the hemorrhage appears different in different shapes brain tumors the brain tumors lots of information can be achieved for brain tumors on the mri look at here i already discussed that gray matter is darker uh, lighter than the white matter means t2 weighted image csf is white here there is a a uh, hyper intense lesion on t2 this is gray matter white then uh, white is white gray is gray t1 and here we can appreciate the contrast so this is a non contrast enhancing lesion in the infraselvian part probably uh, this could be a low grade glioma here there is uh, heterogeneous mass different intensity in the t1 again heterogeneity and heterogeneously contrast enhancing this tumor has uh, seems to be a higher grade glioma on the scan and here this is extremely ill defined lesion that is iso to hypo on t1 and uh, hyper on t2 and heterogeneously can contrast enhancing lesion this seems to be a more Uh, aggressive tumor here so these are the different types of the brain tumors which are visible here now on this uh, ct th these uh, three pictures are of probably the same patients yes look at here this is uh, the contrast is evident here so this is non contrast enhancing this is t1 gray is gray uh, 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 this is a uh, hyper and uh, hyper here so this seems to be a low grade glioma this is the insular lesion insular area this is hypo this is hyper and again non contrast enhancing this seems to be a low grade grade two uh, tumor seems to be like that and uh, how beautifully the mri is telling us how much superior inferior and posteriorly it's going on how many zones here 1 2 3 and 4 almost in all zones the uh, insular glioma is visible here certain uh, uh, one thing i want to mention that uh, mri and ct brain alone are nothing they are complementary to each other like uh, in tumors like the ependymoma they it will be calcification calcification on the ct brain and here we can uh, see this is probably an intraventricular tumor causing an obstruction at foramen of monro the periventricular lucency is evident this seems to be a subependymal joint cell astrocytoma these two pictures of the same uh, other patient here this is the ventricular and extraventricular extension the uh, and uh, extraventricular extension is heterogeneously enhancing this is relatively high grade um, ependymoma here uh, again the ventricular and extraventricular uh, lesion the uh, extending from the ventricle into the extraventricular area heterogeneously enhancing marked midline shift and causing marked edema uh, this seem to be a high grade ependymoma for posterior fossa tumor for posterior fossa lesion it's necessary to know where it's actually located this is the brain stem and this is the probably middle peduncle this is basilar artery and we can appreciate here the fourth ventricle so a lesion is present posterior to the fourth ventricle mixed intensity lesion heterogeneously contrast enhancing maybe a vermian uh, pilocytic astrocytoma 
in this case it's the fourth ventricle it's anterior to that anything that is anterior to the fourth ventricle always think about the brain stem this lesion causing the dilatation of the uh, brain stem dilatation of the pons more visible here how much dilated pons is here so this seems to be a bad tumor fourth ventricle is behind that and then cerebellar hemisphere look at here in this image uh, we can see the lesion is basically in the fourth ventricle yes brain stem is anterior cerebellum is pushed behind here uh, uh, and just attached uh, with the peduncle on one side more it's heterogeneously contrast and hence an irregular border with the brain stem so seems to be a ependymoma so different the purpose to see uh, show you the collage of these uh, tumors is to give an idea to uh, that site is important and their characteristics are important for the identification of tumors in case of the cp angle tumor the tumor that has a tail that is homogeneously contrast enhancing the mucosa is enhanced the uh, contrast enhancing the although the uh, eight seventh eight complex is enhanced but it's not dilated so this seems to be a meningioma of the cpn here we can look for the heterogeneously contrast enhancing lesion dilatation of the internal auditory canal this seems to be the eight nerve schwannomas this uh, um, uh, is the tumor that is present in the cp angle infratentorially as well as extended in a coma shaped manner into uh, the supratentorial compartment and uh, this seems to be a fifth nerve schwannoma this is uh, uh, the lesion uh, uh, here i am sorry <laughs> i am unable to show you this uh, is basic uh, this is basically i want to show the hyper intense lesion on t2 weighted image and this was probably the uh, epidermoid and uh, how we can uh, differentiate the epidermoid from the arachnoid cyst by the diffusion weighted image this uh, picture i put it here for the students to have a look very carefully that this in this uh, uh, image it seems to be a mixed intensity lesion in the cp angle carefully when we um, uh, uh, see here the seventh eighth complex is fine the nerves are fine here and this and if we carefully look for here uh, the tissue is above that this is not a cp angle lesion this is basically a cerebellar lesion and in this picture it is more evident here so uh, the exact anatomical details they are very important uh, for the proper surgical planning of the uh, lesion which approach should be um, adopted by the surgeon these are extremely important uh, one thing more i must mention that uh, not only radiology alone is nothing the history and clinical examination these are the mother of all investigations they will give you a lead towards the direction which investigation should be done and then investigation will be complementary to that history and examination and as a result of that surgeon will be able to uh, proceed Uh, surgically or conservatively whatever the decision will be meningioma most of the meningiomas are benign extraaxial lesion and with the broad base supratentorial here uh, seems to be convexity here the tumor is adherent with the box as well mm, a good enhancement of tumor is here probably attachment would be uh, sagittal sinus with the box and even some attachment above as well this is in the cp angle homogeneously enhancing broad base the petrous bone meningioma this is a small meningioma uh, this picture is to uh, give the idea that on uh, they are quite variable on uh, t2 uh, uh, this is the iso intense if they are hypo intense then uh, it's uh, a consensus 
that uh, their recurrence is more in uh, those uh, meningiomas. Probably some part is here or uh, could be, if we will view the different images, could be the outside something else because bone seems to be okay. Here, this is the convexity as well as the parafelsine and parasagittal meningioma here attached with the uh, fox as well. And these are the different views, extra axial lesion, homogeneously enhancing, and uh, these are all meningiomas. In case of the cellar supracellar area, the best thing is first have a look on the cella. Cella is enlarged or not? If the cella is enlarged, then no doubt the most chances of would be of pituitary macroadenoma. Here, even it's a uh, kenosp 4. Uh, it's uh, dilated and extending into the cavernous sinus, cellar, supracellar part, homogeneously contrast enhancing. Here, it seems the dural tail is here, huge homogeneously enhancing mass. The cell is not so much enlarged, even abutting the uh, basilar artery posteriorly and engulfing and casing the both internal carotid arteries. And uh, this is a huge meningioma. This seems to be a tuberculum cell, meninge, cell is of normal size, supracellar component, dural tail is there, and homogeneous enhancement is there. This is mixed intensity lesion. Here, cell is not enlarged, a big supracellar component, and uh, this seems to be a uh, craniopharyngioma. Here, uh, this is a, a T2 weighted image, hyper intense could be an arachnoid cyst. So uh, how can we differentiate? Um, seems to be arachnoid as margins are regular, not projection like in this picture, like here, as this seems to be the uh, epidermoid and we can differentiate them with the help of the diffusion weighted image. So in all these lesions, the cella is not enlarged. The major component or the major bulk of the tumor is supracellar. So these are uh, uh, not, uh, we can safely say these lesions are not uh, pituitary adenomas. In pituitary adenomas, mostly, mostly the cella is enlarged. Here is a contrast enhancing lesion, slightly more posterior. This seems to be a germ cell tumor. Multiple brain as well, it can give us information, very well demarcated, some edema, wall is tight, seems to be multiple abscesses. This uh, is, uh, these are the multiple lesions, paraventricular in location, homogeneously enhancing. These uh, seems to be the lymphomas. These are the multiple lesions, homogeneously enhancing, and the out of proportion edema seems to be mets. And uh, these are heterogeneously enhancing lesion, multiple lesion, maybe multicentric gliomas. So as far as MRI is concerned, the MRI gives us lots of information about the anatomical details, about the size, site, extent of lesion, and uh, it prepared the surgeon what to do with that lesion regarding diagnosis and uh, medical or surgical management of that lesion. The now we move on to the magnetic resonance spectroscopy. What is a magnetic re resonance spectroscopy? The magnetic resonance spectroscopy is basically an analytical uh, analysis of the metabolite of in the given area of brain. The different metabolites, or we must say, the most of the metabolites within the brain, they can be detected uh, very easy. Few metabolites, like who are less than 0 0.01 nanomole, like the dopamine and serotonin, they can't be detected. Certain molecules which are too large, like the proteins and uh, uh, the enzymes, they, are not, uh, they uh, can't be detected. But most of the metabolites, creatinine, choline, they all can be detected. So a given specific area of the brain is selected uh, or the suspected area of lesion is uh, selected. From that area, the uh, 
these metabolites are detected and they are displayed or presented in resonance uh, as uh, a part, part of the um, uh, part, part of millions uh, they are displayed um, so that they show different peaks each metabolite is uh, having unique characteristics each metabolite has uh, reproducible properties so when they are expressed and uh, they are displayed they gives us a lot of information one important thing is that the angle that is made in uh, between the line that is at the peak of the creatinine choline and n acetyl aspartate when this line makes an angle with the horizontal x axis then this is called hunter's angle when this angle will be distorted this is the normal mr spectrum so hunter angle is there so when this is distorted choline peak will be more and acetyl aspartate will be lower it indicate that there is some pathology is there i uh, mentioned that uh, each of these metabolites they have unique properties they are the hallmark of different things like lipids they are the indicator of the brain destruction lactate of anaerobic gliosis and acetyl aspartate is a neuronal marker so when the uh, we look at different peaks it will give us lots of information that uh, probably this underlying pathology is due to the presence of these specific metabolite is this and we can rule out the other possibility from them uh, uh, these are the normal peak values and ratios so this uh, mr spectroscopy is very helpful in differentiation of tumor from radiation necrosis means after a radiation when the patient will present if we want to rule out the whether the patient has recurrence or uh, this is just the radiation necrosis then in that case the different peaks it will give us information that uh, uh, if the choline peak will be more the uh, uh, choline creatinine ratio will be more and n acetyl aspartate peak will be lower down then in that case it will gives us information this is tumor recurrence in the same way in the um, abscesses the choline peak will be uh, low the lipid and lactate peak will be high the cystic tumor the uh, uh, choline peak will be high from primary tumors the along with choline the creatinine and uh, uh, um, myoinositol will be high while in case of the mets only the choline peak will be high so this is uh, very helpful in identification and uh, uh, making a uh, confirmation that this is a mitotic lesion or the other lesion just a uh, 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 few more slides one or two the radiogenomics the radiogenomics is basically uh, a very new entity like in the mr spectroscopy we are able to uh, detect the metabolite at a given specific area in case of the radiogenomics in a given specific area the uh, morphological features are identified so um, as we know the uh, natural history of the tumor and the treatment modalities that are offered to the tumor they show a very complex pattern it called due to the behavior of the uh, tumor that's why after 2016 the tumors has been uh, uh, classified according to their behavior Uh, rather than according to their microscopic pictures so what is radiogenomics it is a broad spectrum of computational method that extract the quantitative features from radiographic image first the acquisition of data is achieved this uh, data is then pre processed the area of interest is detected suppose this is the area of interest this is the lesion here the features are selected about the tumor size its texture its shape its intensity and then they are given to the computer uh, like this is some sort like of the artificial intelligence this these morphological features when they are feed to the computer then they will give us uh, knowledge 
that okay uh, what's kind of this uh, a lesion and uh, how the treatment modalities will be helpful what would be the prognosis biopsy uh, usually the gen in genetics the biopsy usually uh, gives us the genetic information about the tumor many times the biopsy will be negative many times uh, it will be non conclusive many times the biopsy in case of the heterogeneous lesion it would be difficult for that in all those cases in non invasive radio genomics will be helpful in radio genomics what they will offer they will gives us information about the precise diagnosis they can predict the prognosis they can assess tumor response to the treatment in the same way the information when they are gathered information like the um, the morphological features for example in any area what about the uh, borders of that lesion what's the texture what's the intensity whether the non enhancing lesion is crossing the midline or not whether the hypoxic uh, um, area is more that will produce more uh, angiogenesis so all these information will predict and uh, uh, about the diagnosis and prognosis and the uh, a response whether the anti tumor drugs will be helpful for them so uh, um, this is uh, in almost uh, some sort of trial basis or uh, people are working on that and the much research is needed on that but one day uh, definitely it will be helpful and that's all about for that thank you so much Thank you so much, madam, for coming. Thank you so much for the one. I take the mask off. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor Pausa. Uh, well, it is was the idea see, to give the overview of the radiology for the, for medical students and young residents. Then, thank you. I well, really appreciate your, your lecture. We enjoy very, very much. Our, our next speak is Professor Luana Maranhão Gato, or Gato Maranhão, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Luana is a neurosurgeon from Brazil, from Curitiba, working in our city. He's working in the University Hostel uh, of a Catholic and Medical School. She did her training in Curitiba and after the fellowship in endovascular. She will talk about basics in the vascular anatomy and some pit cases that to show that you need to know about this vascular anatomy. You know, everybody's talk about AVM, everybody talk aneurysm, but nobody showed the anatomy. We need to know the anatomy, where you are, where you go, how to do this better thing. Okay, Luana, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, please. I thank you. <laughs> Uh, congratulations to the excellent, inspiring uh, speakers. Um, I will try to do my best. Um, Dr. Noor says I'm young, but I'm not so young. Um, I'm 37 years old, and I have been a surgeon uh, for 10 years and an interventional neurologist for eight years. And uh, first of all, uh, I congratulate uh, all women on this day um, because being a woman is not easy, especially in neurosurgery and more especially in interventional neurology. But we can. <laughs> so let's share. Share. Okay. Can you see him? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Borba, um, who was my professor during my residence and my master, and who is one of the most brilliant uh, neurosurgeons that I um, ever seen operating in person. And um, despite he was a brave boss, but, but today I understand that uh, 
it was great for my training and I have to thank you. In second place, um, I'd like to say that my English is not so good. Uh, so apologize in advancement um, for any mistakes or if I don't understand something. Um, I prepared a text to help me. Well, uh, for starters, um, I'd like to say here in Brazil, to be an interventional neuroradiologist, um, there are three possible prerequisites. To be a neurosurgeon like me, to be a neurologist, or to be a, a radiologist. And currently, uh, there are officially 149 professionals, and nine of which are women, including myself. It's an era in medicine uh, with a lot, a lot of advancement uh, and growth in recent years. There are still few women um, and the challenges are great, but the rewards are huge for those who love what they do, like me. Well, um, cerebral angiography is the basic exam that is part of the neuroradiologist uh, daily routine. Uh, and it's the gold standard of the, uh, for diagnosis of most cerebrovascular disease. Uh, also in recent years, um, other non-invasive exams have been gaining more and more space with improvement uh, on their quality, mainly uh, angiotomography and angioresonance. Uh, angiography still plays a fundamental role in the diagnosis and treatment of many diseases. Uh, cerebral angiography uh, is, based, is based on the acquisition of leaf images of blood circulation in dynamic movement uh, through ionizing radiation. Uh, for this, the blood is opacified using non-ionic iodinated contrasts. It was uh, like uh, Professor Dr. Neussi uh, said before, uh, it was for, uh, first performed by Egas Muniz, a Portuguese neurosurgeon in the year 1927 even before tomography and resonance. Uh, therefore, in the beginning, it was one uh, of the only tests that existed um, to try to discover any lesion or disease or, or intracranial lesion or, or disease. And the injection of contrast was performed directly in the neck uh, through the carotid artery. Um, in the past, there was no knowledge about uh, radio protection, uh, and there were many complications, both from carotid puncture, uh, contrast, and radiation. Nowadays, um, the approach is preferentially through the femoral artery, um, in the growing region and in some cases in the arm, um, radial or brachial arteries. And the professionals uh, involved use lead individual um, protective equipment. And the NG suite room has resources for protection against radiation. In the materials used it, introducers, um, catheters, guide wires, and other endovascular devices are increasingly safe um, and always with new technologies develop, developed by uh, bioengineering to increase safely. Here, um, one picture is worth than 1,000. Um, words. You can see my puncture in this video. Uh, as I said, the puncture is usually performed in the common femoral artery. 
uh, there the introducer is insta installed um, and through it the materials will be conducted. Uh, this is the Seldinger technique, like um, Professor Nelsi said before, with a needle and guide wire. Yes. We have several diagnostic uh, catheters uh, with tips and uh, with different angles for each situation, which will be guided um, through a hydrophilic guide wire. Once again, a video. Um, this is a video showing the endovascular navigation. The catheter uh, will navigate through the iliac arteries, abdominal aorta, thoracic aorta, uh, and aortic arch. Um, only by fluor fluoroscopy. And then from then on, only by um, acquisition of images and study um, uh, of the vessels officially began from the brachiocephalic trunk, um, common carotid artery and subcaven arteries, moving on to the selective catheterization um, of the internal and external carotid arteries and vertebral arteries. Uh, through them, the contrast will be injected, drawing the entire intracranial uh, circulation. Okay. The main vessels um, to be studi studied will be uh, in the neck, carotid and uh, vertebral arteries, carotid, whether the common, internal, or external, and all its branches. Uh, in the uh, anterior circulation, mainly the ophthalmic artery and uh, anterior and middle cerebral arteries. And in the posterior circulation, um, basilar, posterior cerebral arteries, uh, and all cere cerebellar arteries. Um, here is, uh, are the anterior posterior of and lateral angiographic views of these uh, vessels I mentioned. It. Uh, common here, common carotid artery, uh, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery and its branches, internal um, carotid art artery in the segment, in cervical segment and intracranial segment and the branches of, of the external cerebral artery are uh, superior thyroid artery, lingual artery, facial, um, ascending pharyngeal, occipital, um, posterior auricular, uh, internal maxillary artery, uh, middle meningeal artery, uh, accessory, meningeal artery and the superior temporal um, artery. Um, in the, uh, here is the ophthalmic artery in the lateral view, the first intracranial branch of the internal carotid artery here and here. Uh, in the uh, anterior circulation, we have the anterior cerebral arteries in the interhemispheric fissure above the corpus callosum are the anterior cerebral arteries uh, with their main uh, terminal branches, uh, pericallosal and callosal marginal arteries. It's an anterior posterior and lateral angiographic view. Uh, the middle cerebral artery uh, is the main artery supplying most of the um, cerebral hemisphere and has multiple uh, important uh, cortical branches. Here is the anterior circulation of the brain, an internal carotid artery uh, on the left side. It's bifur bifurcation. Uh, it gives rise to the 
uh, middle cere or cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. And here is the uh, anterior cerebral artery on the right side and the uh, middle cerebral artery in the right side uh, because we have a key. Uh, we have the communication with the anterior communicating artery. Um, the posterior cerebral arteries are the terminal bifurcations of the basilar artery in the posterior circulation and supply the occipital visual area here basilar and its bifurcation, posterior cerebellar arteries, um, here under posterior view, view and the lateral and geographic view, and um, its uh, bifurcation, um, their branches are uh, parieto occipital uh, branch and calcarine artery. The vertebral arteries, um, are branches of the subclavian arteries give rise to the cerebral posterior circulation. Um, each vertebral artery um, uh, make the union with the other side and uh, does the basilar artery. The basilar is the result uh, of this union of the vertebral arteries and is the most important artery in the posterior circulation, um, AP and lateral view. And this one, this basilar shows an aneurysm and a fenestration. Uh, still in the posterior circulation, we have the cerebellar arteries, um, ICAS and PICAS. Um, these are the ICAS, anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. And this ICAS and the superior cerebellar arteries, like this, um, uh, are, arise, from the uh, arise from the basilar. Why the PICAS or posterior inferior cerebellar arteries uh, arise from the vertebral arteries? Here. In angiography, uh, we studied three phases of blood circulation, arterial, parenchymal, and venous phase. Once again, uh, therefore, despite traditionally uh, being called just arteriography, uh, their correct thing uh, would be angiography. The, name, the correct name is angiography, uh, in which we have arteriography, parenchymogram, and venography. We have here the arterial phase and the parenchymal phase and the venous phase. Always enter posterior and uh, lateral view. And some uh, another projection if uh, we need. It's important to inter in interpret the brain circulation in a dynamic way. Um, it's different from angiotomography and angioresonance that are uh, static e exams, but angiography is dynamic and um, we, we, we must interpret this dynamic way with a all the collateral network formed by the circle of wheels. Um, only, only this way we can understand some anatomical variations. Uh, for example, um, to understand that here is the right side, uh, internal carotid artery, um, middle cerebral artery. This is the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, is a fetal pattern. And what, uh, where is the anterior cerebral artery? Is um, it secluded or doesn't exist? No. Uh, we can hear, uh, see here the parenchymogram of its territory uh, from the right side is give from the left side because 
the uh, uh, communicating artery is very good and the uh, cerebral, uh, uh, anterior cerebral arteries both um, arise from this left side. This, we call that this A1 uh, segment from cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery on the right side is hypoplastic and the left side is uh, dominant. And um, we must also uh, make several projections and angles of the same images uh, because we appear to be uh, in an, an anteroposterior view position, may not be uh, in lateral or oblique or Hertz or Tawny or Caldwell, etc. For example, uh, it's here an aneurysm, maybe, but in lateral view, we see that there is no aneurysm. This is just the uh, normal intracavernous segment of the internal carotid artery. So um, basically, um, cerebral angiography is today a min minimally invasive method um, for the study of stroke, whether ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke uh, or other disease in which there is an important participation of cerebral vessels. In ischemic stroke, until about um, 20 or 30 years ago, and geography only served to assist um, in the investigation of the etiology of the stroke. Um, in other words, um, the patient had already suffered a stroke, like here uh, on the territory of the anterior cerebral artery or in the territory of the middle cerebral artery or in the territory of the posterior cerebral artery. And uh, this patient was left with the sequelae and nothing else could, could be done except re rehabilitation. Um, however, the investigation of the cause of this stroke was carried out and um, in order to treat and prevent new strokes. Uh, which we call uh, secondary prophylaxis. Through uh, angiography, one of the causes found are the clogging of the vessels by cholesterol plaques, uh, which are atheromatose plaques of the cervical vessels, carotid or uh, vertebral arteries, or even of intracranial uh, vessels, such as the middle cerebral artery, uh, for example, his um, uh, stenosis from the internal carotid uh, artery after the bifurcation and uh, before and after the angioplasty with a filter and this is uh, with this stent. And in this case, angioplasty could or could not be performed um, uh, it, depend, it depends on the patient, on the clinical case, uh, through the placement uh, of a stent, like here and like here. So um, a carotid or vertebral or basilar angioplasty, for example. This is a good example um, in which angiography allows not only the diagnostic exam, but also the endovascular treatment in the same surgical time. Um, this scenario uh, still exists, um, although non-invasive methods, like uh, I said, uh, such as angiotomography and angioresonance, are gaining more and more space. So uh, today, it, angiography is re reserved only for cases 
in which endovascular treatment is already indicated at the same time or in place that for some reason, uh, angiotomography and or angioresonance are not available or have no good quality. Here is a uh, stenosis from the basilar artery um, before and after uh, this stent. This is the state, uh, stent placement. He open, opens in um, within the atheromatous plaque and the blood flow is normal after. Um, however, in recent years, uh, angiography has taken on a much more um, dramatic uh, importance in the context of ischemic stroke with um, the acute treatment through mechanical thrombectomy. So, um, one more video. Uh, mechanical thrombectomy in stroke is nothing more than removing uh, through endovascular uh, catheterization what is obstructing the passage of blood in a vessel of brain and uh, which is leading that region, that cerebral region of the brain with a lack of uh, oxygen to neuronal death. This obstruction, you see um, stent retriever. Uh, this obstruction can occur uh, by a clot, like in this video, uh, or by an atheroma fragment. And this is like um, we, we do the mechanical thrombectomy. We know um, that uh, large trials show it um, and one A level of evidence for a mechanical thrombectomy uh, performed in patients with a neurological deaths in the first hours and ob obstruction of large vessels like here, uh, obstruction of the basilar artery. And this is uh, very, very sad because um, obstruction of basilar artery, uh, probably the patient will die. Um, and, this, uh, and thus, angiography as soon as possible became essential to save these patients. Um, stroke units are, are being built in much, in much has been developed um, to improve these results. Interventional neuroradiologists uh, from all over the world have improved the technique so that this, this procedure is increasingly faster, more effective, safer, and without complications. So um, on the side of the hemorrhagic stroke, Angiography can also be diagnostic and allow treatment at the same time, uh, like in the um, ischemic stroke. The classic example in the uh, hemorrhagic stroke is subarachnoid hemorrhage, secondary to the rupture of uh, cerebral aneurysm. Angiography. Um, allows confirmation of the presence uh, and location of the aneurysm. And in addition to the interventional neurologists being able to perform at the same stage, um, the treatment of aneurysm occlusion through embolization, either with microcoils, uh, remodeling balloon stent, flow diverter, or a combination of these devices. Even if embolization is not performed, um, angi angiography provides the entire uh, morphological study of this aneurysm. Um, its size, um, 
shape, position, measurements, characteristics, etc., cetera, um, with which the neurosurgeon will have enough uh, information to perform the microsurgical clipping safely. Um, re regardless of the type of definitive treatment, um, whether by clipping or endovascular, a common complication of subarachnoid hemorrhage is vasospasm. In, uh, we can monitor uh, by, by transcranial Doppler and by angiotomography, but also by angiography. And once again, angiography allows not only the diagnosis, but out, also the treatment. Um, mechanical angioplasty of vasospasm through balloon inflation. You see this thinning um, vessel and with the inflation of the balloon within the middle cerebral artery and after the diameter is normal or fast normal. Um, the, if the vasospasm spasm is focal and in large proximal vessels, this um, uh, mechanical angioplasty can be done, but the, if the vasospasm is distal and diffuse, uh, we cannot put the balloon uh, in, within in these vessels and we inject intra-arterial um, into the catheter of the angiography itself um, vasodilating agents. Um, yeah. And uh, in addition to aneurysms, uh, another cause of hemorrhagic stroke um, that can be studied and treated uh, endovascularly are the arterial venous malformations, um, AVMs. In this case, uh, the nidus of malformed vessels uh, can be partially or totally occluded by embolization using glues. You can see here the, um, the blood in the fourth ventricle, um, hemoventricle, and anidus uh, from the avium in anteroposterior view and in lateral view. And this endovascular treatment can be alone sufficient for healing or just be an um, adjunct to open resection microsurgery after. Pre and post uh, operative embolization. The standard angiographic finding of uh, AVMs are, um, is early venous drainage and the presence of an idus. Uh, different from uh, other ca cause uh, of hemorrhagic stroke, uh, there are dural arterial venous fistula. And they have also um, communi anomalous communication between uh, artery and vein uh, with uh, early venous drainage but uh, different from AVMs, uh, dural arterial venous fistula don't have um, um, nidus, anidus. The same principle occurs when the anomalous communication between artery and vein uh, is located within the cavernous sinus, uh, featuring the carotid cavernous fistula. Uh, in both conditions, um, dural arterial venous uh, fistula and carotid cavernous fistula, um, uh, we, uh, angiography helps in diagnosis and also allows treatment at the same time. And finally, uh, I will give an example of four conditions um, 
that are not stroke, but that cerebral angiography plays an important role. Number one, uh, benign intracranial hypertension, uh, formerly called idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Um, it's a condition characterized by chronic headache and loss of visual acuity, uh, usually in overweight women and accompanied by bilateral uh, papilledema and lumbar puncture with uh, an opening pressure um, above 20. There is no tumor or hydrocephalus or other lesions in the neuroimaging that justify this intracranial hypertension and the venous phase of angiography or venography uh, may show a focal venous thin and strictures. Then uh, pressure measurements uh, are performed before and after this stenosis. And if the difference in the pressure gradient is above 10, uh, the disease is confirmed and angioplasty with a stent placement is indicated. Number two, um, cerebral angiography in the context of the uh, certain intracranial or head and neck tumors. Um, it's known that some tumors are highly vascularized uh, and receive blood supply from some specific branches. Uh, for example, meningiomas from middle meningeal artery uh, or other meningeal arteries, um, juvenile nasongeal fibroma from the internal maxillary internal uh, artery, um, jugular glomus. Uh, from ascending pharyngeal artery. And in this case, some surgeons prefer to perform preoperative pre embolization of these tumors in order to reduce intratumoral vascularization, to reduce intraoperative bleeding. Um, the tumors in the angiography appears to a parenchymal blush, always like meningioma. Um, parenchymal blush and juvenile nasolingeal fibroma and jugular glomus. Number three, um, I, I'd like to say that occlusion balloon test is um, a helpful test. It's performed uh, when there is a possibility of having to sacrifice and in internal carotid artery. And we need to know if the circle of Willis uh, is, is good via the anterior communicating artery. In other words, if when closing uh, one carotid, uh, the other one on the other side uh, will compensate for the lack of it in this cerebral hemisphere. This usually happens um, in cases of carotid ingressing tumor or in giant intracavernous um, aneurysms or in carotid cavernous fistulas. So uh, what we do is uh, repro to reproduce the occlusion of this carotid for a few minutes uh, by inflating a balloon inside it and lowered the blood pressure of the patient and tested its uh, motor and cognitive functions. And um, um, something similar is carried out to uh, test not the right-left communication, uh, uh, like here, occlusion balloon test in carotid uh, artery, uh, but we can test the posterior, anterior circulation communication uh, of the brain but, um, um, through the posterior communicating arteries. And number four, the WADA test. 
Um, this test, I brought um, more to knowledge uh, and it's no longer used today. Uh, during this angiography, the anesthetic is injected through the catheter uh, into an internal carotid artery. And uh, that anesthetic uh, is sodium amytal, uh, which temporarily blocked the function of language. Thus, it's possible to find out which site is the dominant hemisphere. It was used to indicate um, epilepsy surgeries. Well, um, I hope I was clear in the formation and with my English. <laughs> um, I love what I do and I take great pleasure uh, in in sharing what little I know to our students and uh, feel invited to visit me here in Curitiba. Uh, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a capital of Southern Brazil uh, with two or three million inhabitants. Hello, Wonderful presentation. I was watching here all the time with the phone. <laughs> thank you, thank you. See? Thank you. It's the way that you, you show, very nice, very, very nice, very complete the way that you want to show today all the people. Thank now, you. Noor, yes, now sir. Your, your turn. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> so it, it will be a very short one. Uh, I think that uh, that was a, a point that I uh, considered should be discussed. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Luana, for the wonderful and very amazing um, uh, presentation. It was so nice to um, see all this, those wonderful slides. So, um, um, and your English is so amazing. I don't think uh, you explained it so well. Thank you so much for being here. So ha happy to see you. And, you know, um, women are always young. <laughs> so you are and you yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, okay, so this is um this is the this is a point that I really thought that uh, that is of uh, the interest of the uh, practicing neurosurgeons since we are using increasing amount of radiation and there is increasing uh, tendency of endovascular intervention. So I thought that this is something that uh, everyone should be aware of. And these are the Alara principles of radiation protection. So what is radiation protection? It is based upon three fundamental principles. Uh, that one um, obviously includes number one, justification. Uh, that is an individual exposure to the medical radiation should always have a greater benefit to the patient as out with the negative consequences of the proposed examination. That one is for the patient. So it is the risk benefit ratio that uh, only you can only justify that the benefit of having this um, 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 radiological uh, investigation will be of benefit as weighed against the risk. The second one comes to optimization. It is the basic, uh, you know, LRA, keeping doses of the ionizing radiation as low as reasonably achievable. That is LRA, okay? So the third one is the um, application of the dose limit to ensure that the individuals are not exposed to an unnecessarily high amount of ionizing radiation. Eco occupationally exposed workers limit an effective dose of 20 millisieverts a year as averaged over a defined period of five years with no single year, with having a more than 50 um, servers public exposure limits is one millisieverts in a year. No, me, uh, nor, nor could you reactivate your PowerPoint? Yeah, look on the screen there. You need to reactivate it so that the slides are clear. What screen do you? Yeah, just sh screen share again, but reactivate that PowerPoint, please. Oh, sure. I, I, sorry I just... to interrupt. No, no, no. Thank you. You see how uh, can you, you, need see to you need to reactivate it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you see it now? Yes, okay, but it's not a full screen. You can see what I see, right? You see reactivate? Let me check. Can anybody else see that? <laughs> no, no, you are right, because I can see on my other device that it's uh, not coming. Full screen. It's Let okay. me check. If, if not, that's fine. You can continue. No, 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 no. I, I will just uh, do it again. <laughs> okay. 
Just a moment, please, for the inconvenience. Okay. The digital break. I'm just uh, actually uh, restarting my own um, PowerPoint. Can you see now? Yes, it's a little, yeah, perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, um, okay, starting from the very start, uh, radiation protection, uh, it is based on the three fundamental principles. First of all, the justification, that is the risk-benefit ratio, that the benefit is more than the risk. Optimization is the second one, where, uh, which is, you know, the LORA principle, where I could say that keeping doses of ionizing radiation as low as reasonably achievable. The third one is the application of the dose limits to ensure that the individuals are not exposed to any unnecessarily high amount of ionizing radiations. Hello? Can, uh... Uh, I don't think that, um, uh, can you see my slides now still? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So the International Commission on Radiological Protection is, is the one responsible for the development of these principles. Let me go forward. Elara as low as reasonably achievable. Some radiographers prefer the time. A, um, LRP or as low as reasonably practicable, the two terms are equivalent in meaning and purpose. The basic uh, LRA principles are just three, that is the time duration, the distance and shielding. That is, in first, first we will just take, take one at a time, at a time. And why do you reduce the time? It is best to use minimum possible time and uh, spend minimum possible time in any place where there is radioactivity as minimum as possible and to use and to use a quicker procedure as um, you know that is reducing the time of both the exposure and both the procedure the other thing is distance increasing the distance decreases the exposure and the third one is shielding we are going to explain them one by one now in detail There, uh, today my PowerPoint is getting a little uh, overwhelmed. Elara is not simply achievable as a safety principle of radio protection that states that whenever an adaptation has to be applied to humans, um, animals, or materials, it should be as low as possible, if possibly achieved. So it is basically designed to minimize the radiation dose and release of the radioactive materials more than merely a basic practice. Elara is predicted on legal dose limits for regulatory compliance, and it is a requirement for all the radiation safety programs. So it is basically the fundamental to the principles of radiation protection. So this is what I have uh, mentioned before that. You have to keep a safe distance, and those rate decrease as the distance in increase. You can see it in the in this graphical representation that as you increase the difference in the distance, the dose obviously decreases as you go away from that source. Number two is the shielding. Place something heavy in between the radiation source and and the person who has been exposed, and those rates decrease as the thickness of that shield in Increases. You can see thicker the uh, scale, there will be obviously reduction in the dose. So these two things. The third one comes the short the time. Shorten the time while being close to that radioactive material. If you have to go there, just try to make that exposure as short as possible. Exposure doses decrease as the time shortens. You can see it is the graphical representation here. So it is basically a regulatory guideline that were initially developed to protect the workers from unnecessary exposure in the nuclear radiation plants. Any medical professional who works with ionized radiation should be familiar with this acronym, that is the ALARA. With increased technological advances, X-ray techniques have become even more sophisticated, and they are using complex diagnosis and treatments, which means that ALARA principles become even more important. So we should be well aware of this very important 
um, uh, principle. So Elara includes taking ready graph based upon the patient's need as determined by the exam by an examination using the faster scale compatible with the diagnostic task, collimating the beam to a size as close to that of the film as much as feasible, using lighter diaphragms and thyroid shields when they would not interfere with the image. The basic radiation safety principles above are commonly regarded as some of the most important ones for the protection against the external radiation sources. However, there are even more risk limiting measures that you can follow to stay protective against the intake of radioactive materials or on take skin contamination. So these are those were the external and those were the other ones in first. Getting a little, uh, you know, um, a little uh, overwhelmed. I think the screen share has been ended. Let me start it again. I don't know what's getting wrong with the with my PowerPoint today. <laughs> You'll get it. Well, uh, yeah, it really happens, uh, but okay. Let me check. I, I have it's to happen. open it's it happen. again. No, no worry. There, there you go. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Sorry for the in inconvenience. So um, uh, when we go like, um, okay, I just uh, start from there. Um, so we have to go into the discussion. The solution to pollution is dilution. This is the, what we stated here. This principle applies to radioactive materials in the air, water, or the soil. The idea is that using lower concentrations will reduce the intakes and the outtakes. Collection. That is used as little as possible or to clean it up and keep it clean. So selection refers to reducing the amount of radioactive material produced or used. It may also refer to reducing the amount of radiation that is produced by a machine. Source barriers. Um, again, uh, achieving, achieving the source barrier in the principle involves engineering control super situating the general radioactive material. Common examples include primary and secondary containers. Work compartments such as hot cells, glove boxes, and fume hoods can be also used. Here's an example I have given of this compartment. Last slide, um, glass windows provide full view of the interior. Steel structure with smooth exterior finish that uh, easy to decontaminate, customizable with various gas taps, laptop supports, and iron chamber lift, internal stainless steel box with rounded corners for easy cleaning, etc. So this is... Um, Force barrier. These are the personal barriers. Similar to the shielding principle, personal barriers are to isolating yourself from the radioactive material or radiation by using a personal barrier. Some uh, barrier examples include the personal protective equipment, such as the thick glasses, lead aprons, and gloves. You can see here the visor, integrated thyroid collar, expanded protection, um, proper cream, exoskeleton. Here they have uh, given you um, their recommendations. The visor should have a 0.3 mm lead, integrated thyroid collar, about 5.5 mm lead, expanded protection, 0.5 mm lead. Both front and the sides, then uh, one mm lead in front of lead areas. Proprietary exoskeleton removes up to 100% of the weight from the user's body. So, this is something that is very important. Many people uh, consider it, uh, you know, a little uncomfortable to wear the air print. So, this is something that is very important. We really need to take care of this personal barrier. Sometimes people uh, do not quite uh, um, use these uh, things to protect their own self. Decorporation, that is get it out or off of here. Decorporation refers to the removal of the radioactive material from the inside or the surface of the body. The decorporation principle is especially relevant to anyone who has received the intentional onset of the radioactive material. 
optimal technology, choosing the best technology. That could mean just an ionizing radiation technology, which is the lower dose of technology, which does not involve ionizing radiation at all. So if you have any other um, options, just go for it. I don't know, but it's keeping, uh, I think I have uh, updated my system, so that's why it's having a little bit of uh, uh, trouble right now because uh, I, uh, my windows have been through a recent update and it usually doesn't get very, me very nicely. Effect mitigation includes the reducing the effect of uh, effect of a given individual dose and collective dose. Some examples of effect mitigators include free radical scavengers such as the vitamin E, the alpha tocopherol, superoxide, this mutation agent which reduces the oxidative damage. Limitation of other exposure that is not to bound the risk. The key to this principle involves limiting exposure to other agents that could work together, like the genotoxic agent or those that cause initiation, promotion, or progression of tumor. So do not compound all these together. Uh, the pregnant worker and Ilara. Pregnant worker should avoid exposure exceeding 55 milligram during any one month and doses between the 8 and the 15 with pregnancy, since this is where the most sensitive radiation induced effect. Real time dosimeter. This is something that is important to know. A real time dosimeter can be an important tool in helping interventional staff monitors and optimize the time, distance, and shielding in order to keep radiation doses as low as reasonably achievable, let's say Ilara. Uh, we also use these uh, radiation badges. I'm now going to have those if my system uh, reasonably allows me to do so because it has been acting a little crazy today. A radiation dose emitter or badge, it does not provide protection, it should be uh, kept in mind, but it detects and measures the radiation that you have been exposed to. The badge or will detect the high energy beta, gamma, or the X radiation. These dose emitters cannot detect low energy beta radiation from some isotope that includes tritium S3. Radiation monitoring devices are provided by the Radiation Safety Office to measure an individual's radiation exposure from X-ray or radioactive sources. The standard monitoring device is a clippable, a clip on dosimeter badge or a ring badge that can be worn like a ring bearing the individual name and date of the monitoring period it is very important that you do not exchange uh, your badge with uh, somebody else so that your individual risk cannot be you know um, cannot be confused with someone else so you have to keep your badge and your rings uh, with your own self and you are meant not never to exchange it with somebody else so that your exact um, you know those can be um, calculated um, in as much accurately as possible. So this is the batch, and here you can wear it: the eye dosimeter, collar dosimeter, trunk dosimeter, the wrist dosimeter, and the finger dosimeters. This is how it looks like um, in the thing in the figure below. You can see you can place it in the um, um, in the neckline, like the people wear in the in their overall the white coat collar or the white coat. The annual, annual occupational dose limits for um, adults is the whole body five thousand milligrams per year, the skin 50,000 milligram per year, extremity 50,000 milligram per year, and the length of the eye 15,000 milligram per year. So this is um, this is how a TLD bed looks like uh, with a, a crocodile clip, metallic filter that is placed here, sealed polythene pouch where it is placed, transparent plastic, personnel the name, number and name for identification, radiation time, and the period of use. Dosimeter placement when you are wearing lead and dosimeter placement when you are not wearing lead. So these are where you uh, are supposed to place the dosimeter when you are wearing lead. That is the color red over lead and base yellow under lead. Uh, this is the fetal under lead. Chest single dosimeter over lead and ring under the gloves. Dosimeter placement when you are not wearing lead. It is the chest whole body one and the fetal and obviously the under gloves. It is estimated that a practicing radiologist in the United States to see an annual average X ray dose of 3.2 millisieverts. That is for the radiologist. Uh, we are a little different uh, here in our setup. Uh, you know, it is a little different according to what the uh, one is practicing. So, if you, it, it, a conventional general surgery, radiation might not be that much of a problem as the person who is actually dealing with the interventional neurology and those who are dealing with the spinal surgeries, they are using the C arm and they might be a little more exposed than the conventional person who is using general neurosurgery. So, that's something uh, a little different. Radiation labeling. 
Um, these are the three signs. Uh, the one, first one indicates the presence of a radiation source. The second one, the measurable radiation in the area, usually from an X-ray machine. And the third one indicates the presence of a less sensible amount of radioactive material. So this should be kept in mind and should be, every doctor should be aware of these signs. I think I'm almost at the end of the uh, of the slide. If my PowerPoint doesn't play with me again. <laughs> These are the typical uh, radio frequency exposures to which everyone is exposed. That includes our cell phone at the ear at 3000 microwatts per centimeter square and the microwave oven from two feet, 125 microwatts per centimeter square. A smart meter, 10 feet away, four microwatts per centimeter square. Wi-Fi rotors, three feet away, 0.6 microwatts per centimeter square. And the FM radio or the TV broadcast about 0.5 microwatts per centimeter square. So a uh, few mobile companies have, um, you know, boosted that they have um, actually designed a cover that reduces your radiation um, exposure when you have your phone with your ear. So what is the cell phone radiation? The cell phone chemical gates by transmitting the signal encoded signals comprised of radio frequency, energy, a form of electromagnetic radiation. So uh, why it is important, your head and body can absorb over 50% of the radiation from your cell phone during the normal use. So uh, obviously, uh, it is just theoretical, although there is no evidence for this, but theoretically, there might be a risk of, you know, brain cancer in heavy cell phone users. The WHO cl classifies cell phone medicine as possible human carcinogen, although there is no evidence for that. But to be careful, you have to think about that. Again, thank you so much for this, um, uh, for patient listening of this slide. I think uh, it was something that I consider should be added in, in the, for the, for the sake of completion of this topic. So every uh, new surgeon should be well aware of the fact that radiations, uh, they should be, they, they should practice, uh, you know, the principles of radiation protection in order to protect their own selves. So these are some little measures that every uh, person should be aware of in order to protect himself or herself. So again, thank you so much. Uh, and it has been a matter of great honor to have you all the wonderful people around uh, as speakers with amazing presentations. And I am, um, it was so, um, you know, it was a matter of great honor to see many positive comments in the comment session. Uh, again, thank you so much, sir. Professor uh, Barbara, would you like to say a few words uh, for, uh, so that we can wrap up the session? Hello, hello. I'm here. Yes, sir. <laughs> I was, I was watching here. Thank you, sir. Very nice, Maria. Very nice. See. Thank you, sir. It is infor information that you need to know about uh, to expose today. A lot of people having treatment with radiation therapy. Yes. And do you know in the future what you have? You see, soon, soon we start to have many 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 complications not only for the for the patient but the people by, by itself see yeah in cell phone you don't know what will happen you have no idea what's happening in the future it's very low radiation maybe not to happen maybe in 20 years you see the difference yes. but let's see okay i think you have time you are more than three hours online and john <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, uh, thank you, Maria. Thank you, all the participants, and thank you the opportunity. And now in Brazil, it's time to work. Huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. See you next time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Yo, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you bye bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Nice,